This video is sponsored by Adam and Eve. Use the code MIA for 50% off one item and free shipping to the US and Canada. Money, gold, profit. These are things humans have wanted for ages, since roughly 400 years ago. <laughs> Probably longer in some circumstances, it depends. Either way, they are things we want now because they give us the things that we want, the things that we need, the things that we crave. Money, cold hard dosh, is what makes the world go round. It's actually been a staple of civilization for as long as there has been civilization and maybe even longer. And I get it. I like money. I Give me more money on Patreon. No, I can't say that. It'll make me look greedy. Ooh, find more money. Good job. You've earned it. The economy is a term that's thrown around a lot. And it is much like a god in some overdramatic YouTuber way of saying. We, as a society, try to please it as much as we can to gain its favor as individuals and as states. And we also desperately want to know its benign touch. But occasionally, the economy can grow angry, furious, and it can punish those who do not believe in the economy, those who do not pay respect to it. Woe be to the unbelievers who bought a 1% down payment plan from Zillow. Woe be to those who bought subprime mortgages. For your rates will skyrocket and your justice will be swift. Why does it do that? Why is the economy mad at us? Is the economy mad at us right now? That's what some people are saying, but some people are saying it's not. Why is that? That's weird. Does anyone understand this? I mean, not really. Well, some people do, but not you and me, mere mortals. The economy can be all sorts of things. It can be your economy. It can be the way that your local town buys and sells stuff from the grocery store. And it can also be like in 2021, when the price of Bitcoin decided to absolutely explode over $60,000 per coin, when it had recently just only peaked at $20,000, but had been worth like a dollar a coin a year before that. Suddenly crypto was the talk of the town. Everyone wanted a piece and everyone wanted a piece of the good old fashioned NFT that everyone had connected to crypto for God knows what reason. But that's okay, finances are weird sometimes, but in general it's okay. Like also around the same time when brick and mortar video game store GameStop also saw its price absolutely skyrocket, which weirdly enough led to some investment firms closing their doors and some people making a lot of money. But why would shares in a video game store suddenly skyrocket? Why would an internet coin suddenly be worth tens of thousands of dollars? It's weird, right? This is not how a practical economy should operate. It's very confusing and people can make and lose money in all sorts of ways that really don't make a lot of sense. I mean, clearly an ape that looks like a million other apes isn't really worth that much. So where's the value? Where's the value of a Bitcoin? I mean, outside of buying drinks. Stock market is up, but so is inflation. Companies and billionaires are richer than ever but you are not doing that great. Isn't it strange then that you personally can manage your money perfectly well, save it as you probably should, make reasonable investments and properly manage your money and your finances and still somehow lose everything you have because someone somewhere in a place, maybe in another country, fucked up when handling some mortgage loans. Someone lied somewhere, somewhere else, and now you don't have a home. The person who made the fuck up though, they're fine, but you're not. How is that a equal and proper distribution of resources? Does the ghostly godly hand of the market really give everyone their just desserts? Or is there some weird fuckery going on here? How did we even get here? Well, 
I've spent the last like five months, it's been a while since I made a video, trying to figure out why. Please join me on what I think is going to be like a two hour long Vivance fueled haze of a rant about my thoughts on the global economy. In May, inflation hit 8.6%, the highest in 40 years. The direction of the U.S. economy befuddling the experts again and rattling investors in a huge way. Continues to rise for service categories, including rents, as we mentioned, dental services. All three major indexes suffering big losses. The Dow off nearly 4%. The S&P down more than 4%. The Nasdaq dropping more than 5%. Money, 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 must be funny in A Rich Man's World. So said the ancient philosopher A Abba. Truly, those are words to live by. Or is it? When we talk about the economy, we do need to start at the very, very beginning and clarify some terms. It's all well and good to say that we all love the economy, as you should as a devout follower, but where does it come from? And really, what is the economy? It might seem obvious, but a lot of people use their own definitions of the word and their own definitions of how to discuss around the word economy. But when I talk about the economy here and the way that the economy is mostly defined as, it just means the distribution and allocation and production of goods and resources. How do you get the stuff you need? And that stuff can be all sorts of stuff. It can be housing, it can be food, fuel, electricity, entertainment. You want to consume Mia Mulder content and I am paid to provide that service for you, often by patrons or by ad revenue or sponsors. That's the economy, baby. And when we refer to economic systems, we're just talking about the system to make sure that everyone gets what they want and need and crave. You give someone money and they give you ham. This economy shit is easy. But hold on, what if your neighbor invited you for dinner? You're not paying for a good, but you're still getting a good. Is that an economic transaction? You want a good ham? and your neighbor has given you ham. But no one says, I'm contributing to the economy when you're inviting your friends over for a potluck. We'll get into some details about that a bit later, but suffice to say that that is technically still economic transactions. You're getting and distributing goods and services. That's all it means. A common mistake a lot of people make here is to think that money is the economy and that the money transaction is the thing that is making up the vast bulk of economic thinking. It's not. Let's get that out of the way right now. When we're talking about the economy, we're not always talking about money, but we shouldn't necessarily think of the economy in that sense. Let's see, can I, can I sit in a funny word? <laughs> money, money, oh God, I need to, how do I sit in this money? <laughs> Uh, a lot of people view money and the economy as synonyms, but that's just because the way we structure our current economy is by using money as a sort of intermediary action. You want to buy ham, but you can't just go to the grocery store and be like, hey, can I have some ham? They'd laugh you out of the store. You need to give them something in exchange for the ham. But maybe you don't have anything that they would want. This is basically a long-winded way for me to say, that money can be exchanged for goods and services, but money itself is not always a good or a service. Or rather, money is a specific type of good that can only really be used as that transactionary stuff. Sure, you can eat a ham. That has value in itself. You need food to eat. An apartment, you need to live in one, right? So that has value too. Clothes have value because you don't want to be cold. But money only has value because we decided it has value and we've decided that they're worth a certain amount of stuff that then can be exchanged for things that actually have real value like food or housing or entertainment. But they are not the same thing as the economy. 
and they have a pretty unique history of their own, despite what a lot of econ one-on-one -on -one teachers are gonna tell you. But they do have a very closely connected history. So let's dig into that. This is a coin, specifically a two euro, euro coin? I have no idea how European currency works. I'm Swedish, but essentially it's money. We all want it, we all crave it, Sometimes people kill for it, and people will do basically anything that they can in order to get more of it. In our modern day society, the accumulation of money is one of the main driving forces of everything we do. Why do you get up and go to work? Sure, you get up because you need to make money to buy food, but that first step is still to make money. There are very few people around in the world right now who are not focused on making money in some respects. Sure, it might not be your passion project, but everyone needs money, right? You might not live for money, except you kind of do. Unless you're exorbitantly wealthy and financially independent, odds are you have to get money in order to be a person in the world. And if you don't have a job or contribute to the economy, Odds are you're not going to make any money, and if you don't have any money, odds are things are not going to be that great for you. And I say that from personal experience. Um, while I might be a left-wing person, generally, I actually love money. Maybe to a somewhat unhealthy degree. I actually quite like luxury as well, um, which is fine. You can call me a champagne socialist, that's fine. I love the taste of champagne. <laughs> but I think the reason why I have a bit of a more of obsession with money than a lot of my friends do is because in my early 20s I was dead broke and when I say broke I mean like no money in the bank account broke like could not afford a single piece of oatmeal broke oftentimes I would have to ask people online on Twitter even for basic rent money I would have to call up my friends and be like hey can you spare me 20 bucks because I want to eat. Granted, if I was smart, I probably should have moved back to my parents, but my parents live in the country. Where would I find a job there? And frankly, my parents aren't really the richest people in the world either. I come from a very working class background, so I wouldn't want to burden their resources either. I would occasionally be forced to crash on friends' couches because I didn't have a place to stay. It was not great. I will admit, this was not a great time in my life, and I'm not very happy about it. In fact, you can see at the very beginning of my channel that I live in kind of a very small office space that's not really a bedroom. And I've talked before about how that made me a psychological wreck of a person. And, you know, that leaves some traces. Now though, I'm great. This channel has been a booming success and I'm not struggling anymore, thank Christ. I'm not rich by any means, but I'm doing fine. But the thing that I carry with me from that time is that every penny counts. If I can maximize income in any type of way, then I will try to. But you know, I'm not a monster. I have morals. I wouldn't put a YouTube ad on the first few days after releasing a new YouTube video. I mean, that would be monstrous. This would be a really funny spot to put a mid roll in actually. <laughs> so managing money has become a bit of a side project of mine. I like to stay appraised of the stock market and unemployment values and things like that. I like to be involved in the decisions of the economy. I mean, especially now that I'm an elected official, weirdly enough, I know, uh, and I guess that should be part of my job. Have I mentioned on this channel that I'm in politics? Stay tuned for my next video where I'll talk more about that. Now, even though money oftentimes is blamed for all the evils in the world, it's actually quite a neat invention because it does facilitate all the transactions we do in the world. What would we do without it? Sure, farmers and butchers could still do the work that they do, but why would they do it for you? Why would you get to enjoy the things that they have produced? Do you have anything to offer them? Sure, you can probably make something that they would like, but can you make something that everyone would like? I can make YouTube videos, but I doubt my landlord is gonna accept a YouTube video in lieu of rent. So, and odds are, you know that it's a pretty neat invention because there's a pretty famous story connected to the invention of money. Long ago, people produced goods and wanted to buy goods off each other, but they had to rely on simple barter. 
a system that might work fine if you are a farmer and almost everyone you're trading with is not a farmer. You can just give them some of your grain because they are probably going to need grain. But what do you do if, for example, you are a butcher? Are you going to give meat to everyone? Or, for example, a carpenter. You can't just go and build things for everyone. Some people might not want things to be built. So what do you give to them? Enter the invention of money. Suddenly, you could exchange your services for a little bit of money, a new good that had artificial value that you could just exchange for whatever else you wanted and everyone could do the same. And thus, money had been born. Money then is a natural evolution of a barter system because technically you're still doing it. You're bartering money in exchange for goods and services. So we're still technically in a bartering system it's just that everyone just has a little bit of money. And this story of money is the one that is taught in kindergarten and middle schools and high schools and sometimes even universities. It's a good story. It's not true. Anthropologist and anarchist David Graeber points out in his book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, that this narrative of money doesn't actually have any backing in the historical record. In fact, a lot of people seem to have it backwards. Money as we think of it, is probably slightly more recent as people would like to think. And in fact, we invented other financial instruments to handle transactions before money. But that begs the question then, how did ancient societies barter their goods? How did they structure their economies if they didn't have this intermediary step? Did they just own everything together and share the resources that they produced? sometimes, but what was even more likely to happen was a system based on debt. Well, slow down here, Mia. You can't have debt without money, and certainly not before it. How are people indebted to each other if there's no money involved? Graeber points out that this wasn't necessarily a debt of money, but a debt of social trust, interaction, and reliability. You give me a ham, and I'll owe you one. If we lived in a society that was small enough where I was known by enough people, people would know if I was an unreliable douchebag. If I'm just getting hams from people and never giving anything back, odds are people are gonna be less likely to give me more ham. Initially, it sounds like a radical idea that debt is older than money, but this is still how a lot of smaller economies still work today. Let's say, for example, that you and your friend are going to a coffee shop and your friend buys you a coffee and you tell him, I'll owe you one. I'll buy you one next time. You haven't done a monetary transaction despite you actually receiving a good, but you have traded trust. If your friend eventually thinks that you are going to buy something for him of somewhat equal value or maybe not even that, then you have traded tr trust and he trusts you that that's something that you're going to do. But if he doesn't think you're going to be able to do that, odds are he wouldn't want you to owe him one. He would want the money back immediately. Or when you and a bunch of people go to the bar and you buy each other rounds of drinks, odds are you're not really going to be distributing money in the moment. And if you're close enough friends, odds are when you leave the bar, you're not gonna be sitting and being like, well, I drank these two drinks and someone else drank those two drinks and then I drank that, but then you only drank water. So if you're close enough friends, it's all, it's all me. You'll buy me back something else next time. And maybe you do, maybe you give them dinner and then you have another nice time. You're just trading trust back and forth rather than actual money and as I've mentioned in the beginning, those are still economic activities. You are still getting the goods and services that you want. It just means that you haven't used money in that economic transaction because those things still have value. You still want to drink coffee, right? So that has value. You want to eat, you need to eat in fact, so that has value. You want to go out with your friends and have a good time, that has value on its own. Despite maybe you're not even paying any money that specific time. When I was broke, that's exactly what happened too. People would take me out for drinks, I wouldn't have to pay because they knew somewhere back in their mind that once I could pay them back, I would. Sure, you could still involve money in those interactions. You could pay your neighbor for cooking you a nice meal, but why would you do that? That's weird, 
Isn't it? Wouldn't it just be easier if we just owed each other a favor? And that's exactly how a lot of ancient economies operated. Now, those economies probably looked slightly different than the ones I'm kind of giving examples of. They had cultural norms and stop gaps and features that we don't necessarily have. But on the baseline level, this is basically how it works. For us, it's easy to think of any advanced financial institution or economic institution to be in terms of money specifically. But a lot of ancient societies could have institutions whose job it was to make sure that you paid your friends back for favors you owed them. So instead of being wealthy in money, you could be wealthy in trust. Sure, I'll help Sammy. Sammy's always got my back. But green my worm tongue? Mm, I really don't want to give him my ham. Now this all works great in small societies. And things do become complicated once you start entering social groups that are more than you can reasonably keep track of as an individual. How do you know that the person who wants some of your food is a person that you can trust? Because maybe they might disappear somewhere and you'll never see them again. A stranger. Once strangers make up a significant portion of the people you interact with, this system breaks down. You can't trust strangers at all. That is when money is basically invented to facilitate that trust. The idea is still basically founded around the idea of trust. It just means that you have evidence of the trust. And this usually happens around the dawn of agriculture, when cities start cropping up kingdoms are being formed, and societies become quite large. Suddenly it's quite difficult to keep track of who owes who which favors and who can be trusted and not. Keeping track of that many favors is difficult to do. I've been polyamorous, so I know. But money then becomes a better way... Hold on. Um, this analogy fell apart real quick. Money then becomes a good way to symbolize the debt that would otherwise be owed with a favor. And this happened gradually and slowly. Odds are it didn't happen overnight. People didn't just, hey, let's put a face on a piece of silver and that'll symbolize my trust in you. That's probably not what happened. But Graeber has a theory of how it might have happened in that people may have written down their debts and obligations into symbolic physical objects and traded those back and forth as a symbol of their trust of each other. And suddenly that's starting to look a little bit like money or currency. So if your tribe is interacting with another tribe and you don't really know each other that well, well, you can give them an object and maybe someone else from that tribe can give you the object back to show that there has been an exchange of favors. That seems like a pretty reasonable tradition, right? And a lot of tribes around the world, you know, before industrialization and the Europeans came and ruined everything, operated similar systems to this. So it's not entirely unreasonable as we've seen them occur in the world. This goes against traditional economic theory, doesn't it? Almost everyone thinks that money predates debts and that any market system is basically required to use money or basically that any economic system requires some sort of money in order to operate. It's either complete sharing of everything or money. But Graeber shows that there is an alternative. And this isn't a new misconception either. Adam Smith in his 1778 book, The Wealth of Nations, even he argues that this is probably what happened. Money was invented and then people started owing each other money and that's how debt was invented. And this whole thing is typically referred to as the myth of barter. The idea that people would need to barter specific goods back and forth before money was involved. But it probably wasn't. Bartering is not really super practical for anyone, really. Uh, it's not really practical today and it's not really practical for people in the past either. It has happened, to be fair. It's not impossible to happen, but a lot of economists now are theorizing that it probably only really happened when strangers would interact with each other and you didn't really know each other's cultural tradition and you had no other way of conducting any trade. So bartering becomes a somewhat reasonable thing to do. In most of the cases we know about, barter takes place between people who are familiar with the use of money, but for one reason or another, don't have a lot of it around. And this isn't some vague, obscure little misunderstanding in economic theory. It's repeated in college textbook, even on advanced levels, all across basically all economic thinking. This myth is repeated. But again, 
it has no evidence in the historical record. And I think there's a few reasons why a lot of economic theory tends to repeat this myth. And a lot of it just has to do with a vague sense of European superiority. Um, unjustified, but you know how Europeans are. We do like to think that we're better than everyone else. I mean, let's just look at the way that a lot of schools tend to categorize economies in general. You either have market economies, which is the glorious, highest, advanced stage of civilization, America, or you have command economies, which is, depending on who you ask, either gray, boring tenement buildings or fully automated luxury gay space communism. Or you have the third real economy, which is the mixed economy, which has elements of both. And that's Scandinavia, baby! And this is where you can have a market, but the government is also involved in a lot of central planning about the economy. No, 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 quiet, quiet, quiet! And then you have the fourth option, which economists also often include, which is traditional economies, which are almost always portrayed in the sense of that they haven't reached one of the real economies yet. And that's where the European arrogance comes in. The idea that, well, a market economy is civilized and a command economy is, you know, it's not the best, but it's at least a civilized economy. And if you're a traditional economy, that just means you haven't reached this stage yet. But once the introduction of money comes, then you will be right as rain, introducing markets and free market capitalism and stock exchanges and ah. If you are dead set on our economy being the only economy that works, I can kind of see the way that you're thinking here, but there's absolutely no consideration anywhere where I've read that the people who actually structure a traditional economy might do that by choice. One example of a traditional economy is that of the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois as they're commonly called, who before white people came along and ruined everything, would store all of their food in big long houses and then would let women distribute that food according to how they saw fit. And this council of women should, according to at least cultural tradition, consider the need of certain families and how much food there is available and make sure everyone has a reasonably equal share, but also reward hard work and things like that. Like have a reasonable common sense approach to how to distribute that food among the tribe and the society where they are within. But hold on, how is that a traditional economy? Because to me, that sounds like... <laughs> well, hold on, okay, I must be misunderstanding something. Let's go back to the definition. How do they define traditional economies again? Traditional economies, for starters, revolve around a community or family. They govern daily life and economic activities with the help of traditions drawn from the experiences of their elders. Ah, wise. Hold on, that's just any economy? I mean, you'll be hard pressed finding people who work at a job not because they want to support their family, for example, or people who don't take experience in from their elders. Sure, maybe in a much more abstract sense than a lot of other communities have had, but I mean, it's not really spring chickens running the banks, is it? These types of economies depend on bartering if they're going to be doing any trading at all. You fool! That's a myth! You <laughs> So there's a lot of assumptions on how they think traditional economies operate, and oftentimes they are put as lesser than those of a European economy, for example. Not just today by modern economists, but by economists and philosophers hundreds of years back in time. Across economic thinkers, there's almost always the idea that any reasonable civilization and society will eventually end up at the invention of currency and then use currency in order to do the things that they want to do. But that's not true. In fact, there are plenty of examples in history of societies who have had the chance to adopt money either from importing it from some sort of other civilization or by inventing it themselves and then choosing not to do that, structuring willingly their society away from money. Not because of ignorance, not because it hasn't been invented yet, but because they don't want it. Take for example a story that is also being presented in David Graeber's work, A New History of Mankind. And that is the story of one of the leaders of the Wendat or Wyandot people of the 17th century. A man called Kandiarong, or nicknamed the Rat. Or rather, truthfully, his nickname was, which was given to him by the French who were assholes, but his nickname was 
Le Rat. And the French people want me to respect them? They don't respect anyone! The Rat, or Candy Aronk, was described by basically anyone who interacted with him as kind of like a Giga Chad, a man who was extraordinarily skilled in rhetoric and who could basically debate anyone into a corner. And he's kind of famous in some respects, primarily because he negotiated a few peace agreements that made it so his tribe was a lot safer than it probably otherwise would have been during, you know, the 17th century. But he also had a burning critique of European society. A critique that a lot of Europeans just straight up didn't believe could come from someone who was a native of North America. Surely, the Europeans said, a savage cannot have this level of rhetoric. But no, he did. In fact, Europeans of this time, in my mind, were probably the dumbest people around the world. In fact, a lot of his ideas were so well thought out and such a good critique of contemporary European society that a lot of people, including Graeber, kind of credit him and other Native American thinkers for basically kickstarting the Enlightenment, that they could potentially be the source of a lot of 18th century European philosophy. Philosophy like freedom, away from the church and the state and the king. Why should they have such monumental power over us as individuals? In the 17th century though, the idea that the church and the king had absolute power over you and that freedom was even a bad thing was pretty mainstream in European society. And then Kandjarong, the Giga Chad, enters the picture and offers this wonderful critique of European society. I have spent six years reflecting on the state of European society and I still can't think of a single way they act that is not inhuman. And I generally think this can only be the case as long as you stick to your distinctions of mine and thine. I affirm that what you call money is the devil of devils, the tyrant of the French, the source of all evils, the bane of souls and slaughterhouse of the living. To imagine one can live in the country of money and preserve one's soul is like imagining one can preserve one's life at the bottom of a lake. Money is the father of luxury, lavishness, intrigues, trickery, lies, betrayal, insincerity of all the world's worst behavior. Fathers sell their children, husbands their wives, wives betray their husbands, brothers kill each other, and friends are false, and all because of money. In light of all of this, tell me that we Wyandot are not right in refusing to touch or so much as look at silver. Interesting ideas about philosophy aside, unfortunately, History happens, and a couple of centuries more of European colonialism and imperialism, we do eventually end up in a world where basically every society is using money of some sort. A world where we have debts and stock markets and internet TV and all sorts of things like that. And the economy now is super complicated because it spans the entire world. In fact, the economy is probably more even complicated than you think today. If you want a roof over your head, Odds are you're gonna have construction workers from a varied selection of the world. Material will be shipped in from China, Japan, Africa, North America. If you buy a t-shirt, you can't just go to your local tailor because the t-shirt probably was made using cotton that was grown in Africa and then shipped to Asia where it was made in sweatshops and then shipped all the way back to Europe where you now wear it for like twice and then you throw it in the garbage. And 250 years ago, I probably would have done a lot of this myself. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that this is a bad thing. We have actually increased the standard of living for like a lot of people. And part of that has had to do with the fact that we are a more efficient society now. We do have the opportunities to make shirts that last longer and cheaper than someone who may have had to make it alone at home would. The amount of man hours involved in each individual good has drastically gone down. But if I made it myself, I would have to grow something that I could make into a textile. And I would have to make it into a textile and then I would have to sew it into a shirt. And all of that stuff, I don't know how to do. I could learn how to do every step of it, but it would be a lot more efficient if I just learned one step. And this is called specialization. Instead of 10 people each making a shirt from scratch, you can have three people, one that grows the thing, one that processes the thing, and one that makes the thing. And that's just way more effective. And specializations tend to also birth more specializations. 
you may have a farmer that's growing cotton, for example, but that cotton might need some sort of fertilizer. So another farmer could specialize in just making fertilizer, but then you would need to figure out how to make the fertilizer better, maybe by feeding the cows a specific type of food. And then you would have someone who just grows that type of food for the cows. And then it just on and on and on it goes. And while this is happening now on a gigantic global scale, it's also happened historically. This is how the agricultural revolution happened. You would end up with people who are specialized in growing food, and then people who are specialized in protecting that food. Or people who are specialized in building homes, and people who are specialized in building walls, and people who are specialized in administering all of the various transactions that are happening. And at this point, we've become so abstract that it becomes really difficult to have any sort of favor system working. And that's when money really starts to matter. It's not just societies becoming big, it's them becoming complex. And the more complex it becomes, the bigger the role of money is. And that's why today, money and the economy are sometimes seen as the same thing. And as a bonus, this is how we get the market, because that's what a market is. You buy and sell things using the money you just invented, and boom, a market. The dawn of civilization. Ha! Ah, wonderful, isn't it? See, it's, isn't this so fun to learn? And all of this is also what leads to the concept of private property. Because, well, if you live in a society small enough, there's no need to own a specific thing. Sure, you can provide a certain good, but you don't necessarily have to own it. But if you live in a specialized society, let's say that you're really good at distributing food, even though you might not make it yourself, well, you do need to own that food, right? And if you need a place to distribute it from, you need to make sure that no one else uses it instead of you. So how do you do that? Well, you own it, but how do you enforce that? Let's say that you do come back after a trading trip and someone's in your house now. <sighs> well, fuck. Now they are in the house, so what do we do now? <sighs> Fine, I guess we need to all pitch in in society a little bit so we have someone who can specialize in making sure that doesn't happen. And we all need to pitch in, right? We can't just rely on people who need it to pitch in the most, that wouldn't be fair. But what's the person gonna do when there is someone in your house that you want gone? Well, I guess everyone will just have to agree to a fair ruling. Oh, but they don't wanna listen to a fair ruling? Well, I, I guess we have to make them listen to it. Like we can't, we have to follow the rules. <sighs> so we have to have someone who can make sure that they follow the fair ruling in the first place. After all, we need to make sure that people do follow the rules. Otherwise, why do we even have the rules in the first place? I mean, it just makes it easier and clearer and fairer, honestly. If money is a representation of social debt and obligations, we need these stop gaps to make sure that no one takes advantage of it. And it leads to even more social inventions, because what if you end up with a person who don't provide anything for the society? They can't grow food, they can't build a home, they don't have anything. Well, they have themselves. You can become an employee, you can help that person sell the food from that house. And this is great, right? This seems fair and balanced and everyone gets their share and... Honestly, it seems like we're pretty much at the end of history here. We've perfected a society- Oh god, no, we've created slave empires. I bring up this very long-winded story because it's important for you to know that the way we structure society now, where you have a hierarchical structure with a boss and middle managers and people who have power over your life, is not a natural condition. For the vast majority of human existence, this is not how humans acted. But this hierarchical system may originate here, with you being in debt to someone that you can't pay back. And the only way you can pay back is by offering your labor. That's employment. We still have that today. 10,000 years of history, and it's just the exact same relationship. And because of this vast complexity, it can be difficult to know whether or not the economy is healthy or not. If you were a serf in the 14th century, odds are you would know if the economy would have a downturn because uh, you had a bad harvest. And that's basically the whole economy. But with a global scale and a population of billions, how can you know? There are so many unaccounted factors that could influence how good the economy goes. How do I know if a company shutting down 
is a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, the company may have been inefficient and running a loss, but now also those employees who were working there are unemployed. So is that good or bad? So how do we mere mortals tend to judge the economy? I mean, you could look at the price of food in the grocery store, but that also could just be the grocery store being greedy. Or you can take a gander at the thing that everyone says is the best indicator for the health of the economy. The place where the rich and powerful do their dark, dark bidding. Haha, -ha, scallywag! Are you ready to learn about the fucking stock market? Well, I hope you weren't expecting a modern story about the New York Stock Exchange or Robin Hood. We're gonna talk about the actual stock exchange, the one from the 17th century. The number one criticism I get from my videos is that I meander a lot and never get to like the point. Um, I don't know, this one seems on you. What were you expecting? When we talk about a stock exchange today, most people imagine something like the NASDAQ or Robin Hood or somewhere else where you can just buy and trade stocks. A bunch of computers and numbers and graphs and things go up and down and it's people hitting buttons very loudly and just like bruh, bruh. A lot of people are going s s Bro, what are you talking about? But that's where we're at right now. And how we got there has a history that's several hundred years old. The very first thing that could even be analogous to a stock exchange were money lenders and debt lenders, people who would buy and sell the debts of other people. Institutions like this had existed in Italy around the 13th century, um, and it kind of works like a stock exchange, because people would buy and sell debts depending on the value that those debts had, based on the ideas of the lenders thinking that the people who had borrowed the money would be able to pay that money back. It sounds eerily like the mortgage industry, but things really kicked off in the age of enlightenment, when massive companies would form, whose sole job it was to go around the world and pick up cool stuff to bring back to Europe. But what a company is, is not the same thing as what a company is today. You would form a company by basically saying like, hey, I'm gonna go to the Caribbean. I'm gonna pick up sugar and tobacco. Anyone want in? Traders, rich people, and sometimes kings and queens would invest in these companies, and when the ship returned from that journey, the company would be dissolved, and everyone who had invested their share would get a proportional share back. A company could be formed and dissolved within a single trade journey, and that's typically how it was done. Companies were structured this way because generally, monarchies wouldn't want to spend their own money funding these expeditions around the world because rich people prefer to stay rich and if they can get the benefits of the wealth via taxes and shit like that, why would they need to put in the initial investment? So the company was a pretty reliable solution to how to do this. It would open up the trading industry to people who might not actually be traders but had a lot of money. And that way you could fund trading expeditions without involving the crown's money. Now, of course, I'm extremely overly simplifying everything here because we're talking about several hundred years of human history and and obviously these investments were pretty risky. The ship could sink, the crew could mutiny, and sometimes the ship could be beset by pirates. So. Odds are that if you invested in one company, you probably wouldn't do that great because that company could just go under. But people back then did what people do today. They diversify. You could have one trader investing in dozens of various companies because odds are some of them are going to come back and the return on investment on those journeys were quite significant. When Sir Francis Drake circumnavigated the world in search of fucking gold and silver that he stole from the Spanish, and then sold that stuff in Asia for spices and nutmeg, and then returned to Europe, his expedition had a return on investment of over a thousand percent. Oh, actually, sorry, I got that wrong. The return on that investment was five thousand percent. Wall Street bets could only dream. So if you invested a thousand pounds into Sir Francis Drake's journey, you would get a return on investment of 50,000 pounds, which honestly at the time was on 
par with the achievement of circumnavigating the world. And these two facts, that the return on investments could be astronomical and that the risk could be quite high, led to the formation of trade companies. You've probably heard about these, things like the East India Company and the West India Company and those types of companies known for being awful. These companies would often get a lot of benefits compared to other companies from their respective governments or monarchies in that they would often get trade monopolies and the right to field their own armies which led to things like British control over India and various genocides across the history of the world. But we're not interested in human rights abuses uh, because we're talking about finances. <laughs> God, that's 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 horrifying. Sailing around the world, conquering and pillaging and raising opium farms and whatnot, that stuff's expensive. It can be really expensive because you need initial capital to start that stuff up. Especially if you were a trade company that was competing with some of the more big boys, like the Dutch West India Company. What are you gonna do, compete with the British? Nah, nah, nah. So in order to raise capital for their companying, in 1602, they instituted the stock, essentially, a share of the company that could be sold to anyone and for whatever you would want to sell it to, assuming someone would want to buy it. And then in 1611, the first stock exchange was created, which was basically just a building where they would do the trading. Before this, you could just walk up to a person and be like, hey, do you wanna buy? <laughs> do you wanna buy a hundred shares? Buy my stock. And at this time, the only stock that's being traded on the Dutch stock exchange is the one of the Dutch West India Company. But again, other companies were still around. People would still form companies to go on individual journeys and they would come back and dissolve the company again. It's just that these massive monopolized companies were the big ones, but people still had all sorts of other companies. And just as how the modern stock exchange is plagued with market speculation and bubbles and bursts and all sorts of things, so was the Dutch stock market. Because when you have a stock market, you're not just buying into a company in the hopes that it's going to use that money in order to give you a big return on investment, like in the case of Sir Francis Drake, because you can also sell that as its own good, the promise of a future return on investment, which means the shares themselves become the good. Again, we know this. This is how the stock market works. And so far, the stock market still makes kind of intuitive sense. You still are promised a return on investment. And maybe you think that there is a lower risk than the person trying to sell you a share in the Dutch West India Company thinks it is. So therefore you would like to buy the share off of that person, despite that person buying it cheaper than you would. That falls apart pretty quickly because eventually people will start speculating on what the stock price could be eventually in the future. This leads to something called the greater fool fallacy. Let's say, hypothetically, that you own shares in a tulip expedition and the expedition company is doing quite well. It has a regularly high return on investment and yeah, sure, there could be a pretty good return on investment if you were to invest. But if you start to speculate that you could sell the stock to someone else for higher than you bought it for, Eventually, the price can begin to skyrocket to be much higher than the return on investment could possibly be. Hypothetically, let's say that the share price has gone up to 800 pounds per share, but the return on investment might just only be as high as a thousand pounds. So you're only really getting a very small cut of a potential profit because you say, I can sell it to someone else for, let's say, 900 pounds. And then that person says, well, I can sell it for even higher what if I can sell it for a thousand pounds? That's crazy, right? You would get zero return on investment from the actual tulip expedition. But that person isn't thinking about the tulips. They're thinking about selling the stock on to someone else for $1,100. And then they think that they can sell it off to someone else as well. And on and on and on it goes. And the stock price just keeps going up. This is what happened in 1634 in the Dutch 
tulip bubble, which has been overly dramatized on the internet and wasn't actually as bad as people say it was, but it was still technically a speculative bubble, so it's valid for me to use. This is called the Greater Fool Theory, and it all boils down to the fact that you might be a fool for buying the share at this price, but you will find a greater fool to buy it from you. And if you can, good job, you've made a lot of money. But eventually, someone is going to buy a stock that no one is going to want to buy. And that's when the bubble bursts. Over time, more companies are included in the Dutch stock exchange and other nations start to institute their own. And this is essentially how we end up with the modern stock exchange. There have been some barriers here and there, some financial laws have been implemented and some security measures have started to happen as well. But all in all, it's basically the same system. Except, of course, today, instead of it happening in a big room where people actually walk up to each other and try to buy and sell stocks from each other, today it happens usually digitally or by people doing massive trades in the billions of dollars and selling them seconds later, or even by computers who do it automatically, buying and selling back and forth continuously based on weird metrics. Every single trade making a tiny, tiny low profit or losing a little money. Most of the time they do make a profit though, but hold on, if someone is making money, where does the money come from? Well, dear viewer, odds are it's you. Either from strange investment fees that you have as part of your retirement plan, or by saving funds, or by actually trading in the stock market, which might be a good idea if you're very, very careful, but odds are you're going to lose money. Up to 90% of individual traders, people like you or me, who are called retail traders, end up losing money on the stock market. A lot of people don't have the time to do research on every single company that they would like to invest in. And it's not really helped by the fact that there are a number of financial instruments that aren't really connected to shares themselves, but rather about the concept of shares. But one of the main points I want to get to here is that there is a world of difference between the price of a company's stock and let's say the profitability of the business itself. They are two completely different markets. Although people are more likely to invest in a company if it is doing well. There are many companies that are doing perfectly well but are just not listed on a stock market. There are tons of companies that have a sky high value on the stock market, but that might not actually be doing that well at all. Some companies are in debt or making a constant loss, but are still doing fine on the stock market. So of course there is a connection between the price of a stock and how well the company is doing, but that connection is tenuous at best. Simply because people aren't trading on how good the company is doing, they're simply trading on the speculative value of what that stock price might eventually be. And it should be said here that basically all trading is speculative, not necessarily the ones that end up in a bubble. In a bubble, it just means that a lot of people are speculating together that the price is going to go one way. But every time you buy a stock, you don't know how it's going to end up going. You never know if the stock price is going to go up or down or both. But hold on, if so many traders lose money, why do people trade on the stock market at all? In fact, who is it that even does the most of the trading on the stock market if it's not people who just trade? And I don't want to oversimplify the issue too much. Obviously, the stock market is far more complicated than I'm letting on in this video. But for certain people, in certain respects, the stock market essentially just operates as a way to get your money for free. There's a reason why there has been recently a push to democratize the stock market in terms of companies like Robinhood or other companies around the world that essentially do the same thing, that lower the barrier of entry to stock trading as much as possible, not because they care about your financial future, but because they want you to gamble. They're actively designed to make you trade quickly even though statistically, the quicker you trade, the worse that trade is going to be. If you want to save money in the stock market, you have to think in the long term. But a lot of these new market platforms that are cropping up basically everywhere want you to day trade, which is a very easy way to lose a lot of money very quickly. 
Other platforms like eToro, for example, sometimes incentivize you to just copy the trades of someone else, even though that person might not be making any better decisions than you might, and might just be lucky, and have gotten lucky for quite a number of times. But people find it fun. I get it. I also quite like it personally, I'm, if I have to admit. But a lot of the information that they give you is useless. The idea of big movers on the stock market or top 10 stocks this week mean nothing. By the time they reach you, it's already over. And the people who have already made their money, they're in the skyscrapers. Well, maybe one person can't hold strong against the investment firms, but maybe a lot of people can hodl their way to stonks. Hi. Welcome to my office. I'm sitting down because this video is gonna take four days to record otherwise, and I can't stand up for that long. A good way to illustrate the complexities of the stock market, good and bad, is to talk about GameStop. I mentioned it a little bit in the introduction, but I think it serves as a good example of the economy in microcosm, of a reasonable economic turn or trend, and then the absolute fuckery of the actual financial market. There are a few terms we need to go through that no one really needs to know about unless you're a massive financial nerd who uses Robinhood uh, or, or, is, or name me, I'm older. Like, what even is a short squeeze? What is a GameStop? GameStop is a physical store that you would have to go to with your feet if you wanted to buy video games or video game consoles or anything to do with gaming. If you're over 30 years old and also had a crippling video game addiction like me, this place was like a second home. For young people, it was basically Roblox. A short is betting against the value of a stock. You make money if the value of the stock goes down. It works by borrowing shares from someone else and selling them immediately at the current price with an obligation that you will have to buy those shares back later to give it back which means that if the value of the stock has gone down, you profit on the difference. This is called a short position. And hypothetically, if there were 100 shares on the market and you had 10 of them that you had borrowed and then promised to buy back, that would mean that the short position would make up 10% of the total share market. This is slightly riskier than just trading on the stock market normally, because if you buy a share, the lowest the share can go down is to zero. But a share price can go up forever, and you have to buy those shares back. Investors and traders tend to do this when they see a business that's probably not gonna make it, that's struggling. And GameStop is an obvious contender. Contending with online spaces that's selling video games, a chain that's closed in multiple locations all over the world, year after year after year. Yeah, this company's kinda circling the drain, isn't it? But if the price goes up, well, you still have an obligation to buy those shares back. But because shares can be borrowed, they can be borrowed twice, or thrice, or four times, or even more. And because of this, you can end up in a situation where investors have promised to buy back more stocks than there are stocks available. Now, in 2021, regarding GameStop, the total short position among all the investors that had shorted GameStop stock made up 140% of the total amount of shares on the market. This isn't that bad necessarily. I mean, obviously it is too much of a short position than you could reasonably expect, but it's really fine. If you need to buy the stock back in order to give back your borrowed shares to someone else so that they can also buy back their stocks uh, to cover up the fact that there's not enough stocks on the market, that's actually fine. Most people will have probably made their money back already. And even if you don't, odds are that in the myriad of different trades, most people still make some money. But if you put up a short position early enough, odds are that no matter the, what the price is gonna end up being, you're gonna be able to afford to give it back and still make a profit. For a good example of this, look at Tesla, the brainchild uh, of a child. A while back, the share price of Tesla skyrocketed 
and most analysts probably agreed that the price was a bit too high. A lot of people said that the company was overvalued and that much of the new value in the stock was probably just because of speculative value. People were betting that someone else was going to buy the stock from them at a higher price. So if you're a savvy leech on the world, I guess, um, you could do something savvy. You put up a short position. And odds are that because the price is really high, and it might even go higher up than what you were putting in the short position on, over time, that price is going to stabilize. And at that point, you've made money. But what if the price does go up instead? What if you expected the price to go down, but it doesn't? You'd lose money, obviously. As a trader, you're generally not supposed to do that. In fact, we may have to talk about this on your upcoming quarterly. Well, investors have two choices generally. Either they stick it out, and hope that the price goes back down later to make sure that they can give back the shares that they borrowed and sold ages ago. And when a lot of shares are being bought of a stock, that typically means that the price is going to go up. And when the price goes up, other investors are faced with the same choice. Do you stick it out or do you buy shares now so that you limit your loss? This is what's called a short squeeze. And sometimes, certain investors can artificially, maybe, maybe not, increase the price and force other investors to start buying back shares too. And the rumor was that GameStop is going to be the next big stock. Everyone should invest right now because we know that a lot of these firms have short positions on GameStop and if we can bring up the price, we can set the ball rolling. Now, because Dan Olson decided to make a video about this specific thing, right before I sat down to record this thing. Thanks, I, it's actually a good video. I'm not gonna go too much into detail about that right here because it's not really the focus of this video, but it is the focus of his video. And now, of course, profit. Because now so many investors have bought stocks, which further and further drives up the price over and over again. And when the price of a share goes up, suddenly it becomes news. More people want to take part in this. There's a stock on the rise, everyone, wants to be part and no one wants to miss out. So more people buy and that increases the price even more. The question at this point then isn't if the price is going to go up, it's when the price is gonna stop going up. And there's quite a lot of money involved here. Sure, GameStop maybe isn't the most lucrative business in the world, but the money invested into short positions and all sorts of other financial fuckery were in the billions. Some investment firms lost billions of dollars and some even had to shut down, which based, right? Like we love it when Wall Street has a taste of their own medicine. How do you like market manipulation, bitch? And when you get down to it, isn't this what socialism is really about? The common man banding together in order to take down Wall Street. We love it, using their own tools to do it. <sighs> Lovely stuff. And when one makes media of such an event, like some people choose to do, a lot of people tend to focus on the average person who managed to make a bit of money. Sometimes even framing it as a gallant David versus Goliath combat, where the little guy takes on Wall Street. Except of course, that's not really the true story. Because the vast majority of the money involved fighting Wall Street investors came from other Wall Street investors. Contrary to the popular narrative, this is just how the stock market works. One of the biggest winners off of the short squeeze was multinational investment company BlackRock, which has had some uh, morally dubious issues. And it's not like the 1% cares, even the ones that actually lost money on this. The people who own and operate those big hedge funds are still rich. Rich people losing money is not the same as you or me losing money, like normal people. In the end, this is just market volatility, and that's the bread and butter of most investors. If a price goes up or goes down, it doesn't really matter because you can make money on the difference. Some people even buy both a short position and a normal position at the same time, essentially borrowing the stock to themselves and just correct them whenever they make a profit off of it. And then of course, you can do the exact same thing with GameStop as you could with Tesla from the previous example. The price skyrockets, and then you put the short position in. And then when the price starts stabilizing, 
you make money again, which means that even though you might lose money on the short squeeze itself, you can make money on a new short position later on, which means that the billions lost are maybe not as bad as it seems because a lot of these investors have the money to spare to make a new investment. And like, as I said, the price of GameStop shares now is higher than it was before the squeeze. It's not doing well. The price is continuously going down and there is not a lot you can do with it. People who have now put a short position are making money again. And people who made the short position before the squeeze are starting to see that their losses are being recouped. And um, that's not really we the people, is it? Wait, what does this have to do with the economy? Gotta raise the fucking ISO because the sun keeps setting. Well, it has to do with the economy because it's basically a microcosm of the entire stock market. And the stock market is essentially a microcosm of the entire economy. The stock market is going up. Yay, the economy is healthy. And if it's going down, ah, there are some quite important differences. But in general, it's kind of how it works. And that's why it's oftentimes used as an indicator for the economy. But how does that work? Surely goods and services, which is the economy, as we've established, can't be traded in the same way that shares on the stock market can. And it's not as if people are buying bread based on its speculative value. That's kind of true. But think of things like real estate, art, or land, or gold, or silver. And while you might not buy bread based on speculative value, a lot of farming companies do. During the last COVID-19 pandemic, for example, the amount of food consumed in restaurants drastically dropped. But a lot of farmers just kept producing the same amount of food as they had always done. Not because they're gonna hold on to it and sell it later in a short squeeze type of situation, but because it takes time to grow food. And if you slow down production, you might be left behind once the market picks up. So they're speculating, essentially, on when the market will meet the needs that they are producing. Supply and demand in action, except a lot of people can just wait for the demand to meet the supply. We'll talk a bit more about this later in this video. But for now, let's just basically say that the real economy can sometimes also work like the stock market does with its problems. So it's for good and for bad. And this is extraordinarily complicated. Experts oftentimes make mistakes. People's livelihoods can be completely ruined due to glitches in the economic system. Not because the economy is actually sick, but just because someone fucked up regarding maybe a tax payment. Or the stock market had a weird bump. Businesses can be created and lives can end. And that's maybe not the best, but it is the system that we have. For better or worse, this is what we got. Especially since the end of the Cold War. Before the 90s, there was an alternative, but a lot of people didn't like it, and it did fall apart eventually. So now, in the moment, we have the market. The vast majority of the world economy works basically the same way now. Even communist countries like China still are using a type of market system, even though it is quite different than the one maybe used in Sweden. And please, China heads, calm down. I don't want dengue's discourse in my comments. And that kind of makes sense, though. Even a lot of Marxist thinkers kind of predicted that this would happen. It is the natural evolution of imperialism, which was an evolution of colonialism, which was an evolution of the market system back then, which was an evolution of the thing I just talked about a few chapters back. And this has basically all been one long history segment. But that leaves us with two questions. One, is it any good? And two, what's gonna happen now? We're trapped in the present moment. So what's gonna happen in the future? If economic systems have changed over time up to now, what's gonna happen next? Well, we'll talk a bit more about whether or not it's good, and I think you can guess what my opinion is gonna be, but let's first talk about what's gonna happen next. There's a lot of fun theories. A lot of thinkers basically see three roads ahead of us, and these paths forward are tightly wound around the ways we shape our entire society. Because choosing how we structure our economy is basically one of the biggest political decisions that we can make. Strange it doesn't seem like that sometimes. But anyway, the first step forward is nothing. 
nothing happens and we end up basically where we are right now and that that's fine. That's the idea that where we are right now as an economy and a civilization is basically the peak that we have bested all other types of structuring a world and that that's perfectly fine. This is kind of, again, overly simplified, the worldview proposed by Francis Fukuyama in his book, The End of History and the Last Man, who I have bullied many times in previous videos and who everyone loves to bully because he is wrong and incorrect and also wrong. But it is still a worldview that is quite dominant in some economic thinking. The theory basically goes that the end of the Cold War has basically demonstrated that the best way to organize a world is with a free market and a liberal democracy. And as time goes on, our current system is just gonna keep getting stronger and stronger. The ideological struggle has basically been won, he argues. People have realized, he claims, that democracy is just the best option and that the free market is the most democratic of economic systems. And that means that even if totalitarian systems make a comeback, they won't last, just because people will want to return to this one. Even China, he claims, is eventually going to crackle under the pressure and will be forced to become much more like a liberal democracy. Essentially, we have solved the riddle of what kind of society we want. It's this one. Yay! But this theory has received some criticisms, and even Francis has kind of distanced himself from it later in life. And he has recently started to advocate for other types of systems, like those who exist here, the social democratic system of Sweden. Woo! Sweden mission! But most criticism have come from people who actually believe that the road forward actually has to go somewhere. And that can lead two ways. Let's talk about the first. Communism. Marx himself predicted that the natural evolution of capitalism would eventually become communism, just in the same way that capitalism evolved from the systems that came before it. An evolution that is driven forward not necessarily by people choosing to organize society in a certain way, but by the changes in the material conditions of the world that incentivize people to behave in certain ways. Eventually, he argued, the material conditions of the world would be as such that essentially socialism and communism would become inevitable. And he uses history and his argumentation too, because we no longer live in the age of kings. And a part of that is due to the industrial revolution. People have more agency, more power, and that makes it quite more difficult for the kings to be there forever, except for my country, because we still have one. For now, Marx instead argues that capitalism can't be the end all be all of civilization because it contains within it the class struggle. There are two types of people, people who work and people who own, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. These two are inextricably locked in conflict and that conflict will eventually tip over one side or the other. And Marx argues that the way that the world is going, it's gonna have to be towards the proletariat because there are just so many more of us. These two terms are sometimes a little muddled, but for the purposes of this video and for the purposes of like basic left-wing argumentation, you can basically say that your bourgeoisie, if you make your living by owning stuff, and if you make your living by working or selling out your own labor, well, then you're proletariat. Working class and owning class. It doesn't really matter how much money you make, it's your relationship to the means of production. There are technically some middle class definitions in there as well. I mean, technically, I think I would be middle class here, uh, definitionally, but this is, this is going way over the course. Don't ask me, Marx heads. This is not left-wing philosophy 101. This is just a YouTube video. This struggle encourages exploitation. The people who own want to extract more and more money from the people who work. And that's gonna piss you off because you don't want to be exploited, you want to work fairly. And add to that the idea that the market as it is kind of encourages overproduction and there's a lot of factors here, but generally the idea is that capitalism is unstable and eventually it's gonna become so top heavy that it's just gonna fall apart. This would trigger, according to Marx, a response from the working class. The working classes would rise up and redistribute 
the entire system of the economy. A revolution. His theory, communism is quite popular among people who don't like the state of the world as it is right now and would like to live in a society that's a bit more cooperative. But the specifics of how to actually do that differ among many people and let's just say that some previous attempts haven't gone that well. So... And Marx has had criticism from basically everyone. Liberals, like Francis Fukuyama, would say that communism doesn't work because we've tried doing it and it doesn't work. It's fallen apart. And because of that, Marx and his entire theory was wrong. <clears throat> Get bent. But a lot of communists might say that those failures might just be analogous to the failures of peasant rebellions in the Middle Ages. Peasant republics in the Holy Roman Empire, for example, frequently sprung up and rebelled against their feudal lords, but oftentimes would often be crushed violently. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the monarch is the end of history either. Feudalism crushed peasant rebellions for like 400 years. We've only really had capitalism for 200. So a lot of left-wing people would say that the game's not over. But a lot of people aren't on board with communism for one way or the other. And that's fair. It's a scary word. And as a politician for a formerly communist party, the word is controversial, and I shouldn't say much more than that. But then there's a third option. For people who criticize both the left-wing ideologies of Marx and other people, and the people who have problems with the current economic system as well. This third one is less of a movement and more of a trajectory of how some people think that the world is going to go. Slovenian raccoon Slavoj Žižek argues that capitalism could potentially have flaws within it that undermine democratic institutions. We retain the economic system, but that the political institutions of the world that are keeping everything in check begin to fall apart. Now let's make it clear here, democracy is good, right? I think we can all agree on that, and we don't want to undermine democracy, but let's be fair here, democracy can sometimes be quite slow to respond to social changes, or slow to respond to the criticisms of the current economic system. The working class still has problems with the market, but the government doesn't always answer those questions. And as we've seen around the world, a lot of places have had democratic backsliding. They've gone away from democracy, but they haven't gone away from the market. According to the people who love the market, this should be impossible because more money equals more democracy, but that's clearly not the case in some areas. Take that, Francis Fukuyama, ya nerd. You wouldn't believe this either, but like he has actually been recently owned, specifically in this criticism, by YouTube commentator Francis Fukuyama. Because what's happening in the global economy now is that you don't have to have a liberal democracy in order to have a pretty strong economy. You can be authoritarian and still have a pretty integrated economy in the world. In fact, more money could make it harder to reform into a democratic state anyway. Because, well, if money is power and everyone needs money and everyone needs money to exchange for resources, well, the people who have the most money then obviously have the most power. The fact that there is a group of people that own most of the world's wealth basically means that they have more political power than you do. Sure, you both have one vote during elections, but they can put in ads, they can affect studies, they can lobby politicians, they can reform things or have special privileges because they argue that they are job creators. You have none of those privileges, and that basically means that they have more power politically in a democratic system than you do. People who then see this as a trend towards authoritarianism argue that as economies grow bigger and wealth inequality also grows bigger, you're gonna end up in a situation where you have very, very few people controlling everything. Not just giving you a shitty paycheck, but making sure that you are reliant on them for, let's say, housing or food. Basically, monetary feudalism. Even if a lot of stopgaps were available here, I mean, rich people just have better opportunities for running for office than you do. If you're poor, good luck getting elected, but if you're rich, a lot of people will basically expect you to run for office, 
even though you have no reasonable ability to. Like, why do some people want Mark Zuckerberg to run for president? He invented a face rating website. That's not really any good metric for how to choose a leader. And what if that keeps going? And it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Then what? Even just moderately rich people already have their interests much better represented in the political sphere across the Western world than most people do. If you're rich, odds are, if you are in favor of a law, it is much more likely to get passed. The interests of poor people are barely even discussed. So then the question is, well, is this happening? Well, trust in democracy is going down. People are becoming more reliant on charismatic authoritarians. Populism is going up and easy solutions are being marketed to really complex problems, all of which lends itself to authoritarian solutions. It's not the peak of human civilization and the high point of how we should structure society. It is the gradual establishment of the free economic zone of Earth. I prefer the term autocrat. Ah, oh, ah, but of course I gotta mention, the economy has brought many benefits, right? I can sit here and be negative all day I want, but it's still good, isn't it? Money and markets have motivated people to work harder and to try to improve themselves as people. It's not just a economic benefit, but a personal benefit. You become a harder worker, you have drive, ambition. Surely those things are good for the world. Thanks to supply and demand, it's a very easy and reasonable way to distribute goods to anyone who deserves it. The ghostly hand rewards hard work, tenacity, innovation, all things we really want in a society, don't we? It supports people taking risks to come up with brand new ideas that can revolutionize the world. And I mean, let's not forget about choice. I mean, you gotta have choice, right? I mean, you have agency as an individual and if you only have one choice at the store, well. Do you want to make sound financial choices? Invest in the Mir Mulder Real Estate Investment Fund. Our trusted financial advisors are trained and specialized for long-term growth and sustainable dividends, and have recently made us qualify as dividend aristocrats. Mir Mulder stock has had an unbroken track record of yearly growth, regular dividends, and of using innovative technologies to secure your investment for your future. Invest in your future today. Haha! <laughs> oh fuck! Well, turns out money also has a very, very dark side, which I guess is the least surprising fact in this video. Because in theory, the way we structure our economy right now, in a market, is a fair and balanced way to distribute resources. Every transaction is, of course, consensual. Everyone agrees. Surely, this is truly equality. <laughs> well, I do not. Because we're not just talking about consensual transactions back and forth. We're talking about how some people who have more of it have an incredible amount of power over you. If you're rich, you have choice. But you don't if you're poor. Again, I know, this isn't really radical. I can hear you, Archibald. But this can express itself in very subtle ways too. That a lot of people don't often think about in terms of power and economy. Let's say, for example, you're at a bar, you're cruising the nightlife for the one, and the two and the three, am I right? And let's say that you are, I don't know, an average person. You make average amount of money, you live in a studio apartment, maybe you take the bus to work. You're not rich, but you're also not poor. And when you're out cruising at the bar, I mean, it comes up, right? Let's say that your day can't afford to pay for their half of a meal. Does that bother you? Should it? Okay, maybe not a meal, but let's say that they have difficulties paying their rent. Let's say that they're heavily in debt and they can't probably ever get out of it. Does that impact the way that you see them as a person? The way that you perhaps feel about them. It's taken as a given that it should. And I mean, it's perfectly reasonable to make those sorts of decisions and uh, calculations when you're out dating. We do after all live in a society. But let's think about that for like a little bit. That's weird. 
right? Let's say that you're on a date, you're in your late 30s, and you meet someone who's like the best, like they just get your jokes and you're vibing, you're just, mm. the conversation's flowing, the wine is pumping, <laughs> the stars aligning. But then you find out that in their early 20s, they had a crippling gambling addiction, which is over now, they fixed it. They've, they don't gamble anymore, they've taken care of it, but they're still pretty much in debt because of it. And their credit score is awful. That's going to influence the way you think about them, isn't it? And isn't that fucked up, like when you think about it? <laughs> I love making YouTube videos because it's basically like girls not out. I can just be like, hey, isn't that fucked up? But really though, we think about romance, for example, in terms of, well, True love conquers all. But here clearly, true love cannot conquer a bad credit score. But I'm talking about power, right? So let's say that you really do want to date this person. You're fine with them having a bad credit score, but suddenly they might become reliant on you for housing and being able to feed them and things like that. Or maybe buying a car in the future being able to get around, being able to get to work, being able to get a job that's better than the one they have right now. And suddenly you have so much power over this other person's life. Sure, you might be a great person. You might help them and you might be able to help them structure up their life and maybe even improve their credit score. But remember, not everyone is a decent person. Some people are gonna be kind of shitty. Then this becomes a way to control them, right? Let's flip it around. You're out, you're cruising for a date, the wine is uh, rolling and the conversation is flowing and you bump into, uh, I don't know, Mohammed bin Salman, who is very rich, but also a, a horrible, horrible person. Obviously you wouldn't really want to date this guy, right? I don't think he's single. Anyway, he also probably doesn't drink wine, right? Let's say that you have a conversation and he's into you. You're like, okay, you're not into him like at all, right? It's Mohammed bin Salman, like this guy is responsible for people dying. So like, uh, but he's into you and he's promising you a lot of money, a life of luxury, living in a penthouse maybe. And maybe, you know what? Maybe you don't even have to see him that often. Maybe you don't even have to, you know, be intimate with him that often. And you could have all the benefits of his massive wealth. Suddenly, Going on another date with Mohammed bin Salman doesn't seem so bad, does it? Many of you, I'm sure, will hear these examples and think that I'm insane, but so many of you will be like, ooh, ooh, that would be kind of practical actually. And I kind of get that. As I said earlier, I've been really poor and faced with a situation like that, even hypothetical, like I'm not even sure what I would have done when I was poor. Well, how much is true love worth, really? The fact that emotional depth can depend on money doesn't seem like it would be a very good way to structure society. And this happens every single day, usually on weekends, in much, much smaller contexts. Let's take, for example, the idea of a man and woman going on a date and the man gifts the woman a meal, the dinner for in order to woo her affection, which is quite nice. Uh, giving gifts is always nice and a meal is always appreciated. And some men occasionally will expect physical intimacy, for example, in return for such a gift. I know it's completely absurd, but apparently people like this exist in the wild. And then because of that, a lot of women will sometimes feel the need to put out after being given a meal so that, you know, he doesn't have an, a thing about it. You know what I mean? It's just, just to smooth it over. Isn't that also pretty fucked up in the sense that like, oh, why are so many people mentally conditioned to give up sexual intimacy because the other person has paid for something. But again, that is completely fucking absurd because surely you're wooing another person by gifting them the meal, Greg. You're not paying for physical intimacy. You're paying for a bowl of spaghetti that you're gifting to a person so that they will like you. This isn't a transaction. You're not paying for sex with a bowl of spaghetti Greg, Greg, you're dropping the ball. You're giving her the ick. Giving her the ick. So I would say, you're giving her, giving her the ick. 
a lot of people will see this and be like, oh, well, what do you mean? That's fine. This is a normal human way to have human interaction. But no, it's not. Because if you invited your neighbor over for a pot of chili or soup, you're not expecting to fuck them after. You're gifting them a meal too. Greg, but you're not gonna fuck the old lady in unit 2B, are you? Greg. I mean, obviously this comes from a long history, right, of women not being able to pay for anything, women not even having their own credit cards, and men having to pay. Well, shouldn't women sometimes buy men dinner as well then? Sure. Why the fuck not? Embrace the fact that you have a credit card and are able to have a job. You know, if you, if you fucking like a dude, buy him fucking dinner sometimes. Free yourself of the patriarchal ideas that control your mind and your wallet. You know, unless he's rich, uh, cause then fuck it. <laughs> Milk him for all it's worth. Milk him for all it's worth. Should I leave that in? The point here is that transactional interactions are almost never just transactional. They are always embedded with emotions and power and reliance and hesitations and guilt and fear and love and hope. And that, in my mind, is not necessarily a good way to structure a system where a very few amount of people have almost all of the money and everyone else have almost nothing. I think this is one of the reasons why people say money should never come between friends, because it can ruin friendships. If you owe someone money and you can't pay them back in a long time, that friendship could wither and die. But why? Because they have $100 less in their bank account? Shouldn't friendship be able to overcome $100? Ah, oh, but Mia, isn't this simply human nature no human fucking nature i'm so tired of human fucking nature because you'd think that it would be so easy to test and disprove which of course is why it is study after study after study across age groups and demographics and cultures basically all show that once they are introduced to money as a form of transactional currency they become ruthlessly more individualistic. You've probably heard of those psychological studies where people have to cooperate on a puzzle in a certain way, but if they sabotage it in a certain other way, they make more money. Studies there show that if you give them real money, people will act much more individualistic, especially if you promise that they can keep it. And if you give them more money than other people in the group, that becomes even worse. And they start acting like complete freaks because they want just more money. Again, I get it. I, I love money. <laughs> Which, sure, fine. You can be excused for thinking that this is a natural response to having lived in a society where money is brutally important. If you don't have money, you can't pay rent. If you don't have money, you can't buy for food. So, of course, you're going to act more individualistic, at least until you meet your basic needs. But the thing here is that this effect can be shown even if it has nothing to do with basic needs. And even worse, this effect can even be shown in children as young as three years old. They haven't paid rent. Fucking babies haven't paid rent. Babies don't know what a bill is. They haven't been traumatized by living in a society because they haven't lived in a society yet. If you have two groups of babies and one of them has money, that group of babies will start acting individualistic and they will hoard toys and they will behave as if they have to, they have to hit the grind set. But if they don't have money, they're just babies. They help each other, they share toys. All of which they are much less likely to do if they have money. And when I mean that money made them individualistic, that's kind of what I mean. They finish tasks on their own. They clean up their toys on their own. They don't share their toys with others and they don't help other people with tasks. They become more insular. And instead of building a cooperative, fun environment with other babies, they'll just think about themselves, both in terms of what they can get for themselves, but also about not asking for help from anyone else. If this was a problem of just human nature, this is how humans tend to act, it should be the case that almost everyone is gravitating toward the case of individualism. People want money, but that's not the case. And that's not what people are seeing. And in the case of babies, 
you really do want them to help out other babies and to play and to be part of a group. If they're not, they can become emotionally stunted and can lead to quite severe psychological outcomes. So, I guess the advice is to not give them money. <laughs> but ho, say the defenders of our current economic system, what should we do? I mean, sure, it might not be good for babies, but grow up. We're adults, we need to be individuals, and the system we have right now has, despite some flaws, still been a universal good across the world. It has helped billions out of poverty, it has solved many technological issues, and provided wealth to everyone. Right? Right? Oh, hello again. Welcome back again to the office. Turns out, um, uh, we don't own this office anymore and the business is falling apart. Uh, you don't have a job, I don't have a job, uh, and it turns out that the concept of jobs don't exist. Because it turns out that what the economy is, which I hope that you've understood by this point, is not just money. It's not just the stock market. It's not just goods going back and forth. It's all of it. And it's none of it. What is the economy? We're like some amount of time into this video and we're still not really closer to figuring out what the economy is or how to use it to make people's lives better. So what's really the point? The market is just the market. And the market has become the economy and the economy has become the market and its spectral ghostly hand strangles us every single day with its whims and whimsy and strange market manipulations. So how can we use the market to actually make our lives better? Well, everyone says that they know how to do it and yet it never really happens. But despite all of those problems, I mean, what choice do we really have? I'd never. So instead, we have to work within the system that we have, I guess. Reluctantly. But Mia, what about all the positives it has done? Capitalism has, for example, lifted billions out of poverty. The fact is that capitalism has raised half the globe out of abject poverty in the last 40 years alone. But has it? According to the World Bank, the proportion of the world population in extreme poverty declined from 36% of all human beings on the planet in 1990 to 10% as of 2015. Has it really, though? That is due to free markets and capitalism. There is no redistribution program in the history of mankind that could have even remotely done anything like this. Look at this graph. Surely it shows that millions have been saved from abject poverty. But it's important to remember that the limit for what counts as poverty is commonly $1.90 a day. Could you live on $1.90 a day? For reference, that's a bit less than $700 a year. And if you put the poverty line at that level, it doesn't seem genuine that capitalism has lifted millions out of it. It may have lifted millions over that line, but that's not enough, surely. Claims like this tend to mislead you about the importance and effectiveness of the current economic system. Or let's talk about something that's more applicable to maybe people watching this video, because people who watch this video are typically uh, a bit more wealthy uh, than the average person. I know, because I did market analysis on all of you. Also, like, a surprising amount of you are bisexual. Like, I'm not complaining, but like, why are so many of you bisexual? I le le legitimately, I would like to know this. Let's talk about inflation, because you may think that inflation is pretty easy to understand. If there's more money in the system, then goods in that system become less valuable in relation to the total amount of money. But that don't that doesn't make sense like you'll see landlords racking up the prices by ungodly amounts oftentimes above the rate of inflation as it actually is did the supply of housing just collapse in relation to the amount of money what what happened or let's talk about food a lot of foodstuffs have gotten more expensive lately because of some certain events so again very understandable but then why the fuck do massive grocery companies make billions and billions of dollars. How come that the companies that should be the most 
affected by the ongoing economic turmoil seem to be doing the best. During the last fucking global pandemic, billions of dollars of wealth was transferred from the poorest people to the richest. Companies made more money, but you made less. People got poorer, but rich people got richer. Is that an effective distribution of goods and resources? Or is that simply corporate greed using global emergencies in order to rack up the price and extort you? None of this is, of course, illegal. But a lot of times, big financial actors also just lie to make more money. The subprime mortgage crisis, which kind of turmoiled the entire world economy for a little bit, happened because big financial actors decided to lie to each other and to the government and to investigative outlets and to people and to everyone to give out loans that they knew people couldn't pay back. And then when people couldn't pay them back, the entire economy collapsed because everyone owes each other like a little bit of money. Which again, is not even to mention that the fact that the way you're supposed to handle your money is entirely contrary to the way that you're actually apparently supposed to handle your money. If you save money in a good long-term way, if you keep it safe and secure so that you can use it on a rainy day, that's bad, apparently, for the overall economy, because you have to spend the money for the money to be worth anything. For example, you give me $10 on Patreon. Thank you very much. I spend that $10 on buying vape juice at the local vape store. They take those $10 and spend it on something else. And then they spend it on something else, and everyone gets to have a nice flowing economy based on those ten dollars that you gave me. But this is, everyone tells us, irresponsible spending. You should save your money. So you save your money. And what happens instead is that your money becomes less worth than it was before because of inflation. It would have been better for you to buy vape juice a month ago when they only cost ten dollars instead of saving them for a month until a rainy day and now when you want to buy vape juice it's twelve dollars. The fuck? So if you spend money, you're fucked. If you save money, you're fucked. If you invest it in the stock market, you're fucked. If you give it to a bank, you're fucked. It, no matter where you take your money, you're fucked. And along every step of the process, wherever you spend your money, there's always someone, somewhere in some weird financial fucking institution that's just taking a little bit every single time out of your fucking bank account. All of this could be potentially just fine if the market worked as a market should. But it doesn't, because it's also dangerously open and vulnerable to manipulation. People who have a lot of political power or a lot of financial power frequently do insider trading, with no one really catching them unless it's blatantly obvious. The end result is that our free market Capital system needs hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of band-aids in order to even function as a market. Because people will take advantage of it continuously because it's so easy to take advantage of. And let's not forget about the fact that this current economic system is the one that is currently destroying the planet and almost broke the ozone layer. But, 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 but. there are also some serious misconceptions about our economy also from people like me. Take for example the often repeated phrase that only really eight companies around the world are the ones that are responsible for climate change. Which is kind of true. If they weren't around, climate change would probably be fixed tomorrow. But they are only so big and only pollute so much because we buy what they make. Let's say for example that all oil drilling tomorrow stopped. No more oil drilling, we saved the planet from oil. For a tiny bit of time, we'd probably be fine. The world would truck on as it had before. But a lot of other industrial sectors require the products that are made from oil, including things like agriculture, construction, electricity, power. And without that oil, those sectors start falling apart. We have rolling blackouts. We have mass starvation all around the world. Not necessarily because we need food and hospitals to run on electricity, for example, but by the fact that you want to drive a car. You want to put fuel in that car. You want to eat a hamburger. 
and so does your neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor's neighbor and your neighbor's 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 neighbor and everyone over time that adds up it adds up to that people tend to bring up that factoid as a response to other people saying that maybe you need to cut out meat from your diet in order to help the planet well this person says it's not really the individual's responsibility but it's not the individual's responsibility but these companies wouldn't make these pollutions if you didn't have your habit one massive source of pollution is the agricultural sector tractors and trucks and the machinery used to plow the fields run on diesel and that a significant portion of the food that we grow we don't eat because it goes to animals that we then eat and if we didn't eat animals then you know we wouldn't have that but i do feel the need to say i eat meat occasionally like i'll have a hamburger sometimes you just want a fucking steak you know what i mean some salami surely it's not my fault for having little a salami that the world is falling apart actually it's not because you know what that whole thing i said before about like how individual trends tend to impact the global economy and therefore you do have an individual responsibility that's not wrong necessarily but the vast vast majority of individual consumer trends have no impact on the global economy fast fashion brands like h&m and other companies will sometimes make way way too many shirts than they could ever reasonably sell if you don't buy it or if basically no one buys it they don't care eventually someone might buy it and if they don't they just end up in the landfill and they're cheap enough the economy of scale here in relation to fast fashion doesn't care about what you do it doesn't care about what thousands of people do a while ago there was a moment when the price of crude oil went into the negatives they would give you money for buying oil and this is because the oil wealth that a lot of people make tend to just continuously produce oil if you stop an oil well that's gonna take time time that could be profitable so even if it's not you just keep going why would you close it up it's gonna be profitable in a minute anyway sure it's a waste of oil and other resources but that's fine at worst the people in charge of the companies just fire a few poor people and the machine keeps on trucking and trucking and trucking and it never ever slows down Ugh. okay fuckers you get costume changes do you like costume changes do you fucking like it when the costume changes i don't have sets now we've talked a lot about the ghostly hand of the market giving everyone their just desserts. But there's another haunter we haven't talked about yet. The specter of communism. It's very easy to look at the entire scope of the economy and the way that it works and the way that it doesn't work and conclude that it's all a failure. As we've seen, money has power over individual lives, our entire world, and even our own minds. So it's no wonder that a lot of edgy teens on TikTok, instead of finding ways to try to improve the economy, instead just give up on it. This is often framed as a choice between two paths. One, complete doomerism. You can't fix it. The rich are gonna keep getting richer. They're gonna go off to their fucking pedophile islands and you will never be able to fix it. Die. The other is, Let's grab a gun and let's burn this shit down. Let's all get a small house in the middle of the country. We'll grow our own food. We'll all live in the commune. This is sometimes framed as degrowth, meaning that we have to degrow the economy in order to make it sustainable. And that's fine. I'm not going to argue necessarily against that as a economic ideology. Honestly, I would say it's better than what we have right now but I want to present some other choices as well. Because it seems, at least on TikTok, where I spend a significant amount of my free time right now, that those are the only choices that people seem to think are reasonable. Because what if we could use the economy for good? As I mentioned at the very beginning of this video, the economy is simply enough the way that you distribute resources throughout society. 
the way that you make sure that people get what they need. And a market is fine, you just go to a market and you exchange some of your own wealth or material resources in exchange for something you need. That way it becomes very quickly responsive. Well this is where we get into talking about leftism, socialism, Marxism, or even communism, or whatever you would like to call it. I, because I am an elected official in a party that has a history, I am not going to say which one I prefer. Occasionally I'll hear murmurings about a left-wing version of the stock market, but doing research for this video, and which has taken quite a long time, but maybe I'm just stupid, I can't really find like a pretty good argument for it. I mean, sure, there are a few. For example, you could invest more in companies that you would like. Small local companies that you would then have a collective ownership of. I mean, collective ownership, I mean, isn't that really what socialism is about? Let's say that there's a company and instead of like the founder of the company owning and having total control of that company, you could hypothetically also be an owner of that company. Depending on how much effort you've invested into the company, you would get a certain amount of representation out of it, which is kind of like collective ownership. No, wait, that's just the stock market. I think what people are trying to say then is that you would want employee ownership over certain companies, that you would have power within that company. And just as we have democracy in our political world, you would also have democracy at the workplace. But Mia, isn't that socialism? And isn't socialism communism? No, 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 quiet down, quiet down. You're all wrong. Socialism is when the government does stuff and it's more socialist the more stuff it does. And if it does a whole lot of stuff, then it's communism. Maybe, but maybe not. It's important to know that terms like socialism and communism have radically different meanings depending on who you ask and depending on when you ask it. Before the advent of the Soviet Union, Communism had a lot of different meanings, depending on a lot of different leftist movements. It could mean a centralized government that did the choices for you, and the government then is a representative of the people, generally. But it could also mean that each individual profession could organize within themselves, and those professions would bind together to form a cooperative society, kind of like a state, but where each profession had a democratic input on that state. It could mean that towns and villages would organize themselves in whatever way they could and help each other in whichever ways they couldn't, all without any type of supreme authority. If you want to be a leftist, odds are you're probably gonna fall in one of these categories. But there's a fourth one that could work as part of one of these or as a part of its own, but it could also work as part of a market economy, but not as like other market economies would work. I'm talking about cooperatives. You can't buy and manage and sell food at a grocery store, but you and 20 of your friends might. Together you could cooperate and you could split the profits. You can do all sorts of things this way, all from running a local community garden and vegetable shop to a multinational corporation. 100 years ago when leftism was a bit more in fashion, cooperatives made up a pretty important part of it. A lot of early left-wing thinkers said that cooperatives could be beneficial to the establishment of communism, that they would be a good transitionary step. And even Vladimir Ilyevich Lenin himself, um, controversial figure and founder of you know, the entire Soviet Union. Even he said that not only are cooperatives beneficial to the establishment of communism, but cooperatives is communism. They are typically more profitable than current for-profit companies and they do treat their workers better than most companies today do. So why aren't leftists falling over themselves in order to support or found more cooperatives? Because they're not socialist enough for a lot of people. Also, cooperatives still work within the market system, right? You're still forming a company. You're not changing society. And then there's also the 
I guess, egotistical reason? Because, I mean, I'm a business. This YouTube channel's a business. Uh, this is legally a company and it has a name, which I'm not going to give to you. Uh, but like, I file taxes both as myself and as the company that I run. That I am technically uh, the sole CEO, employee, proprietor, founder, uh, whatever other title you want to have as part of it. But I'm that company. And technically, it's not impossible. This company could grow. The channel could grow. This video could become a smash hit. Please, I hope it does. Like and subscribe. It's been a while since I made a video. I'm also shamefully going to be posting shorts from this video. I don't like YouTube shorts, but gotta get on the grind set. So the company could become bigger and eventually I could reach a point when I could hire people to work on my videos with me. Then I kind of would like to still be the owner of this company because I built it, I made it, I founded it. I've made these videos myself for years now. So surely I deserve to own this company like the founder, CEO, girl boss, grand sitter that I am. Don't I deserve that? So what else can we do? Well, let's go down to basics again. What is it that's causing the issue here? Why do people struggle? Why are there power imbalances? Why are people starving? Why are people feeling bad? Well, I mean, typically, it's because of a lack of money. Things cost money. Money is the prime facilitator in our current economy, so, what if we just made things where you didn't need money? People need to buy things like healthcare and food and housing, like that costs money, right? So what if we just made it so those things didn't cost money? What if we just gave people free stuff? Hold on, you might say, where's that money gonna come from though? You can't just give people free stuff because that stuff still needs to be made. Someone needs to build a house, someone needs to give you healthcare, someone needs to grow your food. Are they gonna work for free? I don't think so. Well, here's a radical suggestion. The government pays for it. You may have an opinion on what the government should and shouldn't do, or even if it should exist or not, but the government is here right now. We have governments and they are around and they collect tax money. But hold on, you can't just make things free. You can't just pay for shit for other people, right? That would be disastrous. For the economy but actually no it wouldn't or well it depends on what kind of economy you're talking about let's talk about my country for example skyrim here healthcare is mostly free at the point of use because i know some asshole is gonna point that out it's free for me and that's what matters if i go to the emergency room i don't have to pay a lot of money oftentimes none at all if I have to have an extended hospital stay, I also don't have to pay a lot of money. Sometimes, none at all. My latest withdrawal of medication, which is quite expensive actually around the world, was free, just free. I go into the pharmacy, I show my ID, and they're like, oh cool, you want this medication? And I'm like, yes, and they're like, cool, you can have it all. I don't even need to bring my credit card, just free, which is amazing. But again, my country Asgard does have some consequences because of this. We do have quite high taxes, and that is true. Every time I do have to pay taxes, I do become, for a split second, just against the concept of tax. Taxation is theft. Up until very recently, I've had to pay my taxes in one big lump sum at the end of the year, which sucks because I feel wealthy as fuck during the year, and then like right in September, October, November, like in right now, it's just like, oh, I have to give the government all my money. And taxes aren't good, right? You don't want high taxes. If you live in a place with high taxes, you get to keep less of your money, which makes you less able to live in society. If you have to pay too much tax, you can't invest, you can't start new companies, you can't take risks, you can't further grow the economy in the way that you would like. But actually, the opposite is true. But actually, the opposite is true. I wanna talk a little bit about my own personal example here. Look at me, I look sickly. Obviously, I've been to the hospital quite a lot in my life. As I mentioned earlier in this video, I have been quite poor. When I started this channel, I was pretty much destitute. And had I lived in a country where healthcare wasn't free, I would be in severe medical debt. And I would probably not have been able to start this YouTube channel. 
Now, having this channel, I do make a reasonable amount of money. I'm not rich by any means, but I do make an average salary here, which I'm quite happy with. If I don't have a sponsor, I make a little less. If I do have a sponsor, I make a little more on average. And if I don't release a video in a while, um, I don't make a lot of money at all. And yet, despite all of that, despite me having to pay pretty high taxes on my current income, and despite having had to go to the hospital a number of times, and despite having lived so much of my life absolutely destitute and living off of gruel every day, I still managed to be in a position somehow where I could take a risk. I could start a business. I could start a YouTube channel, which now pays more money into the tax system than I've ever actually drawn out of it. Although now that I'm a politician, my paycheck is also from taxes. So I guess when I pay taxes, I'm paying my own paycheck. Um, I'm just moving money around. <laughs> Every month I give money to the government and then they give money back to me. My story is a microcosm of the overall social effects that social spending generally can have. In fact, not just regarding healthcare, but across a lot of social benefit spending. The more you spend on things like social welfare or healthcare or education and schooling and making sure people are housed and well fed, the more money you save in the overall economy because people will be in a much better position to be their best selves. And the same thing is true for everyone in a society. Not just because they can take a risk and they can found a business and become a YouTuber like me, uh, I do admit that this is an edge case, but because they can spend their money more freely. A lot of people that I know who live in areas where healthcare isn't free or where schooling isn't free, they have to hoard their money as much as possible in case an accident happens or for when their kids grow up and they want to send them to college, which also costs money. But if that had been free, paid for by the government, suddenly those savings can go into something else. You can maybe invest in the stock market if that's what you want, but you can also just, you know, buy a nicer car, buy a nicer house, buy fancier food, just live a better life because you don't have to save that money. You can do whatever you want with it, frankly, and every month you can do more things. Granted, some of that money would have to go to taxes to pay for that, but you would still have more money to spend. And as we mentioned from the very beginning, money is only worth anything if you spend it. Now this isn't just me saying, woo, welfare, I love welfare, even though of course I do, but it's also backed up by study, tons of studies, study after study after study confirms this. But how do you make sure only the people who deserve a free education, free healthcare, are the ones who get it? But ah, taxes, the scary word. Everyone hates taxes, right? Like no one wants to pay taxes and you can't trust the government to spend your taxes wisely. And that's fair. That's not, that's not wrong. Granted, that is a valid criticism, but it wouldn't cost as much as people think that it would. A lot of times when people make the mental calculation between transitioning from a private healthcare and education sector into a public one, they oftentimes just transition the cost. All the money that is spent in the private sector would suddenly be lumped into taxes, but that's not true. And obviously it's not true because there are so many steps in the process of trying to make money that wouldn't need to be existing in a system where it's all public, where it's all free. I'll admit, when I went to see if I had ADD, which it turns out that I do, the public healthcare sector fucking failed me there because they're so overburdened that they basically don't acknowledge that anyone can have ADD, but not in the way that they expect it to have. And especially not as an adult. They're mostly all focusing on kids. Add to that long wait times and critical underfunding, especially in Stockholm where the right wing has, you know, underfunded healthcare, like, like there's no tomorrow. And in my case, I kind of figured that I was tired of waiting and I paid for a private healthcare option in order to get medication so that I could eventually finish this video. <laughs> That's actually why I did it. Uh, I'm kidding, of course, but I do apparently have a lot of ADD. I take such a high dose. It's actually kind of concerning. And what I noticed while trying to find a good private healthcare option is that Holy shit, there are so many advertisements. Take for example, just managing various insurance companies or dealing with marketplaces for insurance companies. Here in Sweden, for example, sure, we have pretty long wait times, occasional. But when I compare that system to, for example, 
American healthcare. Oh, oh. I thank my lucky star. For example, there are entire medical advertisement firms, medical lobbying firms, medical other firms, all of which exist to make you pick them as their healthcare provider. You can have your doctor sometimes prescribe or recommend treatments that you might not actually need, but because they might make more money from it or because another company might. If you have a public healthcare option where it's free at the point of use, all of those industries don't need to exist anymore. And frankly, the people working within those industries, sure, in the transition from one system to the other, they might lose their jobs, but they might eventually move to another sector where they might actually be a bit more productive in their occupation. Don't get me wrong, insurance salesman is a fine profession, I guess, but you gotta admit, competing with other insurance companies to get the most amount of money out of you for the best deal for them, that's not really providing, I don't know, a good for the world. All of those industries could be eliminated. And what you're left with is just the healthcare provision. Or let's turn it around on the other side of it. I know personally many American friends who have not sought out healthcare because they're worried about medical debt. Which is crazy to me because imagine you have a serious health condition and you ignore it in the hopes that it's gonna get better on its own. And sometimes it might, but sometimes it might not. I know friends who have ignored a healthcare issue and it's gotten worse, and worse, and worse, and eventually been needing critical help. And that is not a healthy system. Only getting it almost too late because they were worried about the cost of an ambulance. That's not good. That's not healthy. But in a system where they didn't need to worry about that, like, for example, my own, they could go get healthcare first thing. You're worried about something? Go check it out. No problem. Sure, you might have to wait a lot unless it's a critical condition because people with critical conditions obviously need to take priority, but like, you'll get help eventually for free. And if it is something, they can fix it. And then you can go back and be a healthy, productive member of society. Thinking just in terms of raw, crude numbers here, which economists love to do, this is the more productive outcome because the best outcome for the economy is a healthy workforce. Now to be clear, I'm not saying that you need to be a productive member of society in order to be like a worthy person, but from a purely economic macro perspective, the more people working, the better. And the healthier people are, the more people are going to work. So it makes basic economic sense to lower the barrier of entry as much as possible. And if you really wanna get into the weeds, let's circle back to power again, because I've heard tales of American companies offering healthcare as part of their employment packages, meaning that you don't have to necessarily buy, let's say, your own health insurance because the company that you work for can offer it for you. But that also gives the company the option of withdrawing your healthcare, which they might be able to do in terms of contract negotiations or union negotiations or to prohibit you from having certain ideas within the workplace. That is a strange amount of power. That is close in my mind almost to being a serf. I personally know one or two trans women who have left more paying jobs, not super much, but somewhat more paying jobs to go work at Starbucks because the Starbucks health insurance plan gives you a lot of gender affirming healthcare options, which, okay, wonderful, I get it. You know, fine, go get the bag. I Even I don't get fucking FFS, but I love that for you personally, but why should you be forced to leave a more lucrative job, which in the terms of scale of economics and money is more productive to the economy to work at a less paying one so that you can get good fucking healthcare. Although I will say, I do think that baristas are maybe one of the corner points of our entire civilization. If the barista that works at my local uh, coffee place quits, I sincerely believe my municipality would collapse like within a week. Okay, well, I don't wanna get too simple here. You might be banging on the screen, screaming that, sure, maybe my land of Aurora hasn't collapsed entirely, but neither has America, right? Like America's still 
fine. It's not great, but it's fine. So why should they change if we don't have to? And don't get me wrong, American healthcare can be pretty good if you have the money or if you work at a place that offers like pretty good health insurance. The European idea of American healthcare might be a little oversimplified. But if you're poor and unemployed and uninsured, well, it's the European perception of American healthcare for you. Buddy, hope you like paying a thousand dollars for an ambulance ride. There are some drawbacks though. Let's talk about education, for example. In education, in my country, again, it's free, baby. Free stuff for everyone. Apparently, thank you for the beer money, government. But here in my country, for example, we're actually having a little bit of problems, occasionally, in some sectors specifically, of underemployment. One of the number one occupations here that pays the highest and people are craving for people to be educated in are metal workers and plastic workers and plumbers, people in the trades. Because you can be overly educated, that is true, and you can have a worthless degree, God knows I know how that is. Eventually you do need someone to fix your plumbing, right? And yeah, that's not great. But my country, the land of the Yeti, is fine. We haven't collapsed due to a worker shortage in some sector. We do have some current ongoing issues, but to be fair, I don't really think they have anything to do with metal worker. And this applies to all types of social spending, even things you might not even think of, like, places for kids to go after school, especially in inner city. If kids get to interact with other people and they get to interact with other social groups and they get to do various activities that they might not have done before and try their new skills and interact with adults that aren't just their parents or teachers, that's really good. And it's a wonderful way for young people to become more independent as people in the world and actually saves the total economy tons of money every single year especially in the long term. Because if kids do grow up to be self-confident, independent adults, they're less likely to get into crime, to develop addictions. They are more likely to go into a passion project that could go into a lucrative career. All of those things are great for the economy, even our current economy. But the rub then, if these things are so universally good, why don't we do it? Well, it is all gonna cost tax money. And how do we make sure that the kids deserve that tax money? And this is one of the reasons why left-wing economists typically have a different way of handling the economy than other ones do, especially when the economy feels sick. Take, for example, an economy that's going into a recession. The economy is not doing great. Companies might start shutting down. People might start getting fired. If you're in government, odds are you're gonna want to start cutting corners and cutting costs because you know that you're going to get less tax revenue. When people are fired, they lose their jobs and they become a economic cost instead of an active economic actor in the market. So instead of doing cuts, which would increase unemployment and potentially make the recession worse, you should spend more. You should really infuse more and more tax money into your budget, even though you're going to start getting less tax money in precisely because this creates more money in circulation. More people have more money because you hire more people within the government, but also that the social services that the government provides are suddenly making people feel safer and that the negative outcomes of a recession hit less severely. And if they hit less severely, that makes people more able to go back to find new work, to start their own businesses, to become economic actors once again. These two lines of economic ideology are always in conflict because one of them always wants to spend more money and one of them wants to spend less. If you live in a country that has had a let's say, phobia against big government spending, odds are everyone is going to land on the face of wanting to spend less. Not without fault, though, I will say, because that's how you manage your own economy. But your own finances and your own economy are not analogous to the economy at large. What I'm mentioning here is the strong social safety net, which a lot of people really like, and a lot of people want to implement it themselves. So this type of economic policy would actually be great for modern day capitalism. No, 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 no. But once again, that costs money. Does the government really deserve that money? Or rather, do you deserve to have your tax money taken from you because the government fucked up the economy? When a lot of Americans talk about my country, the snow globe, they often refer to it as a socialist country or a country with strong socialist features. But 
that's not really true. We are still a capitalist country and we have capitalist interests and a lot of these social safety nets are being undermined by those interests so that they can justify lowering taxes. People who are poor are not getting the things that they always need. We still have economic inequality, quite severe economic inequality in fact. And frankly, I feel like a lot of people want to turn us into like America light. It's not the utopia, it's not socialism, it's not perfect we haven't solved the economy either. And even if we had a stronger social safety net, that doesn't necessarily mean that all problems would be solved. People would still be poor, right? Sure, health, but if you don't have a job, you still won't be able to afford rent, or you might not be able to afford food. Sure, we could go crazy with it, and let's pretend for a moment, right? Let's pretend that we could also make food and housing free. We can make the internet free. Oh, what a world, right? But alas, if only I actually had any real political power. And yeah, we could structure a society like that, but it would probably be quite easy to take advantage of. Not just because we are a people that are selfish and unreliable, which I do think Swedes are, but, but rather because we live next to countries where they have markets. What would stop a person from going into the government food store, loading up their truck with a bunch of free food, and just driving to Norway and selling it in their grocery store? Sure, you could have a bunch of checks and balances there to make sure that doesn't happen, but then again you end up with the problem of having a bunch of admin, and that's the thing we're trying to cut. We're trying to make things more simple so that the economy becomes more efficient. But how do we do it then? But the twist is, we already have a system to administer all of that kind of stuff. Which brings us to fucking money. <laughs> I have no idea if that showed up on camera. Free money, free money. What if we did that? What if we just gave everyone free money for free? Instead of dealing with like, admin to make sure that you get access to like free housing and free food what if we just gave you money and you could be your own admin we don't need to have checks and balances on how much free food you get and keep a track of how much everyone is getting we just need to give you the check what if we just gave everyone a lump of money go wild spend it on whatever you want if you want to spend it on for example food and housing you can but let's say you have a job, what are, what are you gonna spend that on then? You could save it, sure, but it's free money. Like you may as well spend it on something. You could spend it on, for example, you could invest it in the stock market and stimulate that a bit, which people fucking love to do. Or you could just buy fancier food. You could invest in something. You could invest in a business maybe. You could finally get started on that hobby. You could spend all of it on Warhammer 40k figurines. Who gives a shit? This concept is known as universal basic income. And every YouTuber apparently has to make a video on it at some point, and this is my entry, I guess. That's like chapter fucking 11 in this video or whatever this is. Not just free stuff, but free money. Free everything! As we said previously, money needs to move around for it to actually do anything, and no one spends money like the masses, especially when they know that the wallet doesn't empty. So, what if we just did that? This is oftentimes thrown off as like a joke, especially by people who make fun of the left wing. Oh, the left wants to give everyone free money. Well, you know, actually, yes. And in fact, this used to be quite a radical idea. You can't just give everyone money. And then, apparently, America just fucking did that. You can do that. It's not a, necessarily a bad way to spend your money, especially if you're facing some sort of abnormal economic crisis, like, for example, a global pandemic but you don't just have to do it once, you can do it twice every year, or you can do it twice a year, or every single month even, depending on the amount and how much you want and how much you decide that you want to do it. The general concept has been thrown around quite a lot, both in left-wing and right-wing economic circles. Goals. If you want to stimulate businesses, that argument goes that if you give a lot of people money, they're gonna spend it on business. And if you are of the persuasion that having a little bit of money every month will act as a stopgap against abject misery and poverty and potential homelessness, having that money works great. You give them a little bit of money and people will be more able to afford rent. There are some arguments against UBI though, but they also differ depending on where on the political economic spectrum you land. Some people argue that 
well, if you give people a lot of money, then they won't want to work. Why would you work if the government gives you money? Which is not a wrong argument necessarily. I know that I might not have worked at some previous jobs that I had if the government would have just given me money instead. But at the same time, I think I would still do this job, for example, if I still would give money by the government. And from an economic standpoint, yes, it does cost taxes, but it would also not cost as much taxes as you think it might do, depending on the way you want to implement it, right? There are multiple solutions to how you fund a universal basic income system. For example, a lot of countries around the world right now have various types of welfare programs, things to make sure that people still are able to eat, for example. Well, under a system of universal basic income, it could be baked in there. You get money from the government in order to eat. So no longer do you need to have an entire department focused on making sure that people have enough things to eat. Or at the very least, you will be able to shrink that department significantly. And that's true for unemployment benefit or other types of welfare, all types of welfare, really. The cost administering those and also the cost of paying that money out could all be lumped into a universal basic income system. The catch though is, that you would need to pay out this system to everyone. Everyone would need to have it, otherwise it wouldn't really work. I see a lot of criticisms that go, well, why should we give money to rich people? Surely that makes no sense. Rich people already have money, so why should they get free money? Well, once you start getting off that money, suddenly you need to hire people to do the gatekeeping, and that costs money money you could just spend on everyone in the first place. I hear a similar argument quite frequently actually about America and free tuition. People will say that it's a bad idea to make university educations free because rich people would get a bonus. Currently, rich people are the ones that predominantly do go to university and why should we give them the benefit? Just make school free for the poor and the rich people can keep paying for it. And the same problem comes up. You need to start administering the gatekeeping. And once you start administering the gatekeeping, well, suddenly you have to draw a line of where the gate goes. And once you start deciding that kind of stuff, well, you have to have a public debate about where that goes. And some people might have arguments back and forth and some people might cheat the system and then you need to catch those people. The point here is that yes, sure, technically rich people would also get it, but it's simpler and streamlined and cheaper for everyone everyone if it just goes out to everyone. It probably wouldn't make that much of a difference in the household of someone rich, but it would make the world of difference for someone who's poor. And it's not just a hypothetical solution. People have tried it in various different areas of the world. My neighboring country of Santaland actually tried UBI in a very limited sector, in a very limited amount of time for a very limited amount of money, and concluded that it didn't meet the expectations. Well, hold on, what the fuck does that even mean? A lot of trials when it comes to UBI are, in my mind, a little weird <laughs> because they will focus predominantly on the economic activity of the people who actually receive it. And there's usually a very small amount of people who actually receive the money. Cause, well, you don't wanna spend too much of taxpayers' dollars on a trial on something. How do they measure the success? Well, they do often measure the success in terms of the stress of the participants and the mental health and the physical health of the participants and also in the economic activity, the risk taking, the way they save, the way they spend. How do the results look? Well, a lot of the time, not good enough, apparently. They say that UBI is not doing the most that it could, but a lot of results also claim that the stress of the participants went down, that the health of the participants went up, and that the participants felt safer and more reliable and could spend more money on, for example, paying off debts or paying rent. But those things aren't necessarily counted as a success when you're only looking on the return on investment. Especially when we're talking about something as nebulous as money in the economy. As fucking always, for like the 15th time I'm saying this, this would also cost tax money. But here's the twist again, just as how we pay for other types of services when we don't get them for free, we also pay for the consequences of those who don't have money now. Take for example the idea that there are many people around the world who don't have homes. They have nowhere to live. And many of them simply say that they just need a place to live, but they can't get one. Turns out you need money. <laughs> 
and rents can be quite high as we've discussed and seen. So what do you do? Do they get a job? Well, how do they get a job without an apartment? Where should they send the contract for you to sign? That's quite difficult. Okay, well, welfare then. Well, same problem, isn't it? How are you going to administer that money if you can't actually live anywhere? You need to live somewhere first and then be able to build your life around it. But of course, we can't just give them homes, right? Why not? You can just get a home and give it to them. What's wrong with that? Well, that would cost money, you might say. Well, to be fair, we already spend quite a lot of money on people who are homeless, but not by giving them what they need. A lot of money is spent on police restricting them and keeping them away from city centers. A lot of money is spent on healthcare provided to people who probably would not have gotten sick the way that they did if they just had a home. Spending money on administrating homeless shelters or for the people who find themselves involved in criminal activity or people who end up in jail because they have to do crimes in order to get the things they need to live. All of those things cost a lot of money and they actually all cost more money than just giving someone a home. If you give someone a home, they'd be fine. Most of the other costs would go away and they would probably save you a lot of money in the long term. But how do we make sure that they deserve that free home? I don't, I don't have another set. I'm sorry. You, you're getting me again, I know. I just wanted a fine transition. As I've said so many times that I'm basically shoving it down your throat, the issue here is rarely ever about the actual cost of the things I'm talking about, but rather about the ideology behind the cost. The ideology that we should not form our society on the basis of everyone having, but everyone deserving to have. And that's the real rub here, deserving. It can stick in your brain of even quite a lot of smart and reasonable people as well. The psychological thinking of who deserves the measures that we have, when you could just as well restrict it to those who've worked to earn it, those who've contributed, the givers. It's like a bug in your brain and in a lot of people's brains, more so in some than others, but it still sits in a lot of people's brains. Why should they get free stuff? I didn't. I had to work for this channel, for this apartment that I'm recording in. I had to work my ass off. Why do I have to do that, but they get it for free? Huh? That doesn't make any sense. And this is the transactional thought virus to its fullest conclusion. This is why cooperatives are not seen as an attractive alternative to normal corporations. This is why we leave homeless people on the street when we could give them homes. This is why education is sometimes not free. This is why healthcare is oftentimes not free. It's why we structured our society the way that we do. That can be a pretty obvious answer, but I think it's worth pointing out that to the people who sometimes think that they're just thinking about cold hard numbers but they're really not. Yes, it is true that everything that I've mentioned would make things better for the vast, vast majority of people and society and the poor and the homeless and the sick. But there's one group that it wouldn't get better for. And that's the rich. And the rich are trying to spend so much of their time and effort and money to argue that if you do any one of these systems, you will get poorer when the actual situation is that probably they would. And I've seen this phenomenon happen in real life in my role as a politician, where you can show people black on white that th it would be cheaper to do a certain measure than to not do it. But people will still refuse to acknowledge it on the basis of that they don't deserve to have that measure implemented. Objectively, in the long term, it is cheaper to give the homeless homes, but many have decided that they don't deserve them and so they don't get them. And we, as a society, have collectively then kind of agreed that we would rather pay more money and have a more inefficient system just to enforce the deserving above actual effectiveness. And this is the transactional mind virus to its fullest conclusion. 
The idea that unless it's a transaction, it doesn't work. That you need to pay someone and they need to pay you back in the transaction for it to actually be worth something. That you need to see the actual ROI on anything that you do. Giving the homeless homes, for example, doesn't do that because it doesn't show up as a return on investment to not go to the hospital and to not end up in jail. Even though those things would be returns on investments and money saved and better for society in general, but because they're not actual returning on the investment of the home itself, people don't like it. In fact, a lot of people actually advocate occasionally to give the homeless homes, but to have a staggered rent that goes up over time and, and then up to a certain level so that you do get that ROI. They can only have the apartment for a certain time. They will have to show an income soon enough or they'll be kicked out and someone else will take it. Someone else more deserving of it. Which means you're gonna end up in situations where a homeless person who has been given a home become homeless again and kicked out from the apartment that they were given because they were homeless in. I don't care if someone who never wants to work another day in their life ends up in one of those apartments that they give out to the homeless for free. I don't care if a rich person goes to school for free. I don't care if a rich person gets free healthcare because all of that means, I don't care about any of that because it means that when you end up in a situation where you need those services, you never have to worry about being deserving enough. And because of the transactional nature of every economic activity that we do, we start to think that the spectral ghostly hand of the market is actually giving out that deserving. That those who deserve it, they will get it. If you work hard, you will succeed. If you manage your money well, you will do well. But how many people managed their money well and worked hard during the last financial crisis? Due to the subprime mortgage crisis. How many people worked hard, managed their money, worked extra much to make sure that they had enough money and then were fired during COVID? Sometimes even fairly minded, kind left-wing people will also fall into this trap. Sure, we all want fully automated luxury gay space communism, but at a certain end of the day, I mean, not everyone can have a free apartment. Not everyone can pay higher taxes. Not everyone can have a free education and everything needs to be paid for somehow. And then the mind virus starts circling its way in. It's not just the material conditions of capital that are causing all of these problems in our society. It's the psychological illness of capitalism. Everything that I've talked about and other alternatives as well that I haven't, are sometimes very good for the economy. Study after study can show it, and there are multiple other ways to make sure that you can help both people and individuals' economy within a capitalist system, even if you don't want to leave it. But the reason the very, very rich don't want you to do that is because it would be their money that you would get. Measures like this would be great for the economy, but it wouldn't be good for their economy. They want you to think that the only option here is to manage your money as best as you can and try to work within the system that they set up. They want you to think that you have them to thank for everything that you have and that if you took anything away from them, the whole system would fall apart. That they are responsible for all the good that the current economic system is giving even though that they are probably more responsible for the flaws within it. They give the magic, they say, and they want to convince you more than anything to not pay attention to the man behind the curtain. Hello again. I don't know what the bit was with this office setup, but um, I guess we're co-op now. I guess we've established ownership over the means of production. So what does it all mean then? Why have I been sitting here rambling about the economy for such a long time? Do I have a point with all this? Probably not. <laughs> but my real point is that it is okay to be mad at the current state of the economy. It's okay to want to change it a lot or a little. And it's okay to continuously say that the defenders of the status quo are almost definitely wrong. And that even if, even if the market worked the way that they say that it works, you're still allowed 
to criticize it. There are alternatives. There are alternatives with how you want to deal with your goods, your services, and your money. You don't have to buy into the idea that you either like the status quo or you want anarcho-primitivism and you want to live in a hole in the ground. That is the framing that the 1% wants you to have so that you don't question anything at all. And while massive systemic change seems unlikely in the short term, there are some things that you can do to, I don't know, be a nice person with the economy the way that it is. Go help out in a soup kitchen because the ones that are the poorest among us definitely don't deserve to be the worst affected when the economy has a bad outcome. And invite your friends for soup dinner. Everyone likes soup dinner. Invite them for soup dinner. Make soup. Give them soup. They drink soup. You become better friends. When I was at my brokest, my most poor, I spent a lot of time living on friends' couches. And at the same time, I could easier find a job where I lived. I didn't have to crash at my parents, for example, and take up their limited resources. And eventually that kind of support from the people around me gave me the opportunity to be able to take a massive risk, which is this YouTube channel. And my friends never had a financial incentive to support me in this way. And my parents didn't have a financial incentive to raise me and support me as an adult when I needed it. But they did it nonetheless, and those things had value. Even if you're a cold-hearted calculator for the economy. They had my back. And now, when opportunity presents itself, I can have someone else's back. So, you should also try to have someone else's back too. And that way, maybe they can have your back later on. And even though it's going to be very difficult to abandon money altogether, we can still help each other in the times when we need it. <sighs> oh, well, as I mentioned a bit earlier, God, I love money. Don't you? Um, and <laughs> I have some fun news. When I first was going to make this video in like this summer, Jesus, I was planning to not have a sponsor for this video. Sad face. I know. However, I have uh, dragged my feet so much that thankfully, uh, I did manage to get a sponsor for this video, even though I, that was never the plan, but I, I'm super appreciative. So it is my wonderful pleasure to present you with the sponsor of my video, Adam and Eve. They make sex toys. I don't need to be core. My entire audience is above 18 years old and bisexual. So uh, yeah, <laughs> you know what they do and you know how to use them. <laughs> That's weird, shouldn't say that. If you use the code MIA on adamneve.com, you can get access to 50% off one item and free shipping to the US and Canada, which is quite a sexy deal. I had initially planned on replacing these potted cacti with like, with like sex toys, but I feel like that would might be inappropriate for YouTube. But hey, anything's a sex toy if you're brave. <laughs> Don't, bad advice. Adam and Eve is a quite lovely company that has sponsored me a bit before and also has very graciously sponsored me for this episode as well uh, because I am not as discreet as their shipping, which is very discreet. Um, they do also give a portion of their income to fight HIV worldwide, which based. So if that sounds like a great sexy deal to you, um, visit Adam and Eve. Yeah. Hi, hi folks, uh, thanks for watching that video. I have been working on this thing like you would not believe. There's, it's a reason it's taken so long and it's a reason it is so long. Uh, and that is, well, I'm, you know, I've hinted on it in the video itself. I'm on medication now and now it seems I can't stop revising and trying new things and actually like having the energy to like really have passion for making YouTube videos, which is good uh, for me, uh, but it's also bad for me because it ends up uh, with a video that's like almost three hours long. The first draft of this was um, almost eight hours long. Um, that's not good. I really was not planning on this video taking so long to make, but I, I mean, I, I, I just so much, so many things have happened. But I have a video that I've been working on for quite a while as well that should come out in November, and. It might actually be somewhat relevant then, uh, even more than it had been if I had released it earlier. So it's, you know, that's, that's kind of good. 
but uh, thanks for watching and I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you having the patience to wait for this video and also to watch like all of it because it's pretty long. And um, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. And I would like to give a special thanks to 12 Tone, Aimi Salminen, Aislinn, AM1VF, Amanda B, Amelia Unchained, Amy Lee, Andy Sophia Fontaine, Angelo Garcia, Angelo Garcia again, for some reason, uh, Esther Olson, Athiet, Balaz Vince Sadel, Blair, Boar Lover, Catherine, Choices Make Me Anxious, Corbusphere, CRT Hayes, Dana Ferguson, Dara, Deanna Morandi Ariseto, Domestic, Eleanor Cassidy, Ellie, Amelia Clark, Emily Formanek, M. Coy, Emma Reese, Erich Owens, Erin Rafferty, Fox Kent, Gwenda Euphoria, Gwendolyn de Middling, Hyla Tracy, Idris Onwards, Jane Lusby, Janelle Torgerson, Jareth Arnold, Jason Haig, Jay Enduro, Jill Isabel Gary, Jurgen, Joshua Analik, Julia Helene, Justin Lowry, Kelly Krautz, Kira Wins IRL, Kiwi, Clea Chinka, LPQ Silver, Lena Chavaz, LGBTQIA Space, Lucas Gray, Madison, Marcus Smith, Mara Neckar, Maurizio, Michaela, Mo Khalifa, Mod Zero, Nia Pasaka, Nicole Danielle, Mjofbun, Paul D. Mackey, Pavel Dubik, Peridot, Robin Graf, Rhea, Rob Howlett, Rose Brunton, Sitzries, Sonic Bread, Spaghetti Berg Address, Steve, Steph Sterling, Talia Parkinson, Taryn Jordan, Taylor Sophia, Thea Vega, Thoris of Mir, Travis Siobhan, Valerie Blackbird, Weirdy Beardy, Winston Cunningham, and of course, Wolfgang, the Grand High Exalted Wizard. Thank you. I'm not going to be able to fix the hole. The hole is there. I'm sorry.